Hello, fellow misfits. We'll start this October compilation with some true, scary stories that will make your spine tingle and will leave you afraid to turn off the lights. Do subscribe if you love our work. Thank you. And now... Story time. I saw something on Monday night that still has me totally shaken to my very core. I have always loved nature. I love the woods, I love hiking and camping, fishing. I'm really into mycology so I'm out looking for mushrooms and various types of fungus whenever I get a chance. The weather was absolutely beautiful on Monday for this time of year, so towards evening time, I decided to round up some of my walleye gear and head down to an old train trestle crossing the Mahoning River in Niles, Ohio. I had parked my car about a mile and a half from the trestle so I could walk the tracks and hit a few other spots along the river on my way down there. By the time I reached the trestle, it was pretty much dark. I was wearing a headlamp at the time so I had a depending light source. At this location, there is a lake directly across the river, which the two are connected by a small overhead dam. I was there for 15 minutes when all of the sudden, this overwhelming feeling of dread came over me. I switched my headlamp on to turn around to start back up the river bank, and right behind a big sycamore tree, I saw what looked to be a very large animal, kind of kneeling beside or behind it. As I locked my eyes on it, I completely froze. I knew I was definitely seeing something there, but my mind couldn't process it. What I was looking at didn't make any sense. The thing that I kept saying to myself was, Animals aren't supposed to look like that. Right as I'm thinking this, it's as if this thing read my mind, stood up, and made itself perfectly visible in the most pretentious way. It almost had this vibe like, yeah, now you see me, you know I'm real, I definitely exist. What are you gonna do about it? And as soon as it happened, it kind of hunched over and made its way into the brush. I was out of there like a flash. As soon as my feet hit the tracks, I ran and ran the entire way back to my car, without stopping. By the time I reached my car, I couldn't breathe. Both my legs were locked up. I was vomiting and somewhere in between the encounter and running away, I had pissed myself. It's early Friday morning now, and I think I've only slept for about 6 or 7 hours altogether. I've been constantly searching YouTube and all kinds of stuff, listening to eyewitness accounts, and it sounds like these things are encountered quite often. I've heard of the dog man before but never really took it seriously. Before the night of this encounter, I would always picture a dog man to look like some little skittish, coyote looking creature. Man. I love the woods and I love nature. The woods for me was always a safe haven I could venture into, to escape stress. Stress at work, bills, relationship problems. I could always take a nice long hike, go fishing or foraging and come home feeling 75% better. Now, I feel like I was threatened and kicked out of my second home. The only thing I can keep thinking is, these things aren't supposed to exist. I feel like a terrified little kid who just came face to face with the dreaded monster in the closet. You know, the monster you parents told you, no wait, assured you, wasn't real and couldn't hurt you. People need to be made aware of these things. They are as real as it gets and they are dangerous. Thinking back to what this thing looked like and how it was built, these things are perfectly adapted killing machines. The way the arms and legs looked, it looked like it was perfectly adapted to walk on all fours as well as on two legs, it was so quiet and fluent with its movements also. It's not like in the movies where the monster comes charging out of the woods, growling and snarling, these things are our masters of camouflage and they utilize the darkness perfectly. I didn't notice a smell from it, probably because the wind was on my back at the time, but it sure smelled me. Its nose was up in the air the whole time of our encounter, just sniffing away. This experience has torn a huge hole in me. Every time I eat, I get nauseous, I can't sleep for more than 20 minutes at a time, and every time I close my eyes, that thing is all I can see. I'm trying not to dwell in the fear, I'm trying to accept what I saw and what had happened, but it's hard. 
I'm really glad I found this group and found a few things on YouTube, so I know I'm not alone. I was an infantry platoon leader in the US Army at the time. My platoon and I were on a mission in Germany, somewhere around the junction of the Czech Republic German border. We had been there for about two months, which is how long it took for our unit to transition from Iraq, where they trained Iraqi police officers, to Germany. We were patrolling the woods when we came to a clearing. I figured it would be a good place for my platoon to take a break from advancing through the dense forest. I went up ahead to scout out what was beyond that clearing. Something was troubling me about how quiet it seemed. Even the crickets, grass, and birds were all quiet. There was nothing, but I figured it was my imagination after the long time spent moving forward without stopping at all. As soon as I turned around, though, they were all standing at attention behind me, their weapons pointing straight up in the air. They had obviously seen whatever had startled them. When I turned around, all I saw was the clearing that seemed to have no life in it whatsoever. So then, I think maybe one of my squad leaders had probably seen something, maybe a deer or some other animal. So I asked them if they had just seen an animal. They all immediately denied seeing anything out of the ordinary and went back to taking their break. I was walking into the clearing to find where they had seen whatever it was that spooked them and I had only walked about halfway across the open space when I heard everybody screaming over my radios, move out, move out. That's all I heard. So then I start running toward where they are, but before I'm halfway there, I hear automatic weapons firing up ahead in our direction. And of course, being combat soldiers, they are trained to be constantly vigilant of their surroundings. So, of course, they are firing at anything moving in the woods around them or taking cover behind trees or logs if nothing else is moving for them to shoot at. But then there were multiple things moving that they could see. Everybody started yelling, enemy behind us. Or he's running toward you to your right flank. So everybody is firing in every direction. I finally get out there, and it turns out that my squad leader had seen one of these creatures run into the path only 50 meters away. He saw it earlier than everybody else but at first thought it was maybe just another member of our platoon. He didn't see the face hidden behind an overgrown mane, but when I got out there, I knew exactly what had startled them, and it wasn't any kind of animal like a deer or elk like I guessed. It was another type of creature, but neither me nor anybody else could figure out exactly what it was, although I knew, I just didn't want to admit it. We never found any tracks to follow or anything else that indicated there were more of these things around, although my entire platoon believes they were stalked by several of these things. So we figured this one must have been a lone hunter or something and got spooked when it got caught between both groups. About a minute later, the woods seemed to come alive with every type of woodland creature you can imagine, scurrying from one side of the forest to another. It seemed they were all trying to get out from underfoot as either us or them passed through their environment. So maybe this was something, I'm not too sure, but I can tell you I think it was a group of these things that were about to attack. Had my entire platoon not shot at these things, they probably would have pounced, tearing my men apart. I believe they were acting in self-defense, and I think they were fighting against these bipedal canine animals. Something mauled a kid. I don't know what it was, still don't to be honest with you. What I do know is I'll be dealing with this until the day I die. I got the call a few months ago in the fall. I'm a park ranger and while the brighter side of the job is you talking to happy families. Helping send the wildlife back to areas safe from harm, there's a lot to this career that can take a toll on you. This was one of them. I pulled into a clearing of a forest in New Hampshire. White pines and firs as far as the eye can see. Autumn made the hue of leaves turn to a carnival of colors as red maples glowed in the sunlight of midday. It was walks like these that made me take this job in the first place. I even wanted to be a park ranger when I was a child. Back when I thought all you did was get lost in the woods, hanging out with bears stealing baskets. It had a way of making you forget it all, taking in the view. 
almost made forget what I was heading towards. The crime scene was at the end of a rocky ravine. Trickles of water spattered on the floor, a backdrop to the poor kid covered in a bloody tarp. I'll spare you the details but I saw the photos sent for the report. Even saw the boy myself. It was awful. Whatever did this ate its fair share. Everything not consumed came in tears with ill intent, scattering his remains around the woods. The animal must have taken its time shredding him to pieces. If there is a god I hope that boy died quickly. The more I read from the coroner's report however, the less I think it's likely. The parents were there to identify the body. The mother's scream seeing her child like this could be heard for miles. It sounded like gutting her alive was preferable to the pain she suffered now. Ugly crying with snot dripping as a dutiful husband stood by. Him using whatever strength he had left to hold her up, back from grabbing the pieces of her boy. Federal officers came in to assist us. All of us there were doing the best we could to ignore her screams of agony and get to work. Photos, collecting evidence and the like. Believe it or not people think we don't care. Unfortunately most of us do. I even know how easy it would be for it to be your nephew or brother in that spot. Seeing his face ripped on the floor, it can keep you up at night. That doesn't matter though. The parents crying would be far more distraught if they saw you weeping too. So you bite your lip, smoke, have a quick cry in the car when no one's looking. Otherwise, you just get back to work. In the middle of the commotion, I saw my old boss. He's an older man, stone cut face from from the wind over years of hiking. A stocky build with broad shoulders, yet held by the hunched, curving spine of a man who could say he was too old for this. The pot belly earned from long hours looking over files at the local diner hung over his trousers. Longer hours were spent drinking a fifth in his car to keep the nightmares away. He looked over the scene with that gravelly face deep in thought. O'Connell. I waved him down, stepping around the photographers and family to reach him. Jameson, good to see you. He gave me a nod and turned away from the scene. I followed after as it was clear he had something to tell me, away from the morning couple near. There was something to show me as well. He pulled a manila folder from his wool-lined jacket and handed it to me. Looks like you're moving up in the world, this your jurisdiction now? Yep just moved me over to Hillsboro. What are you doing over here, although you worked back in Concord? I took the folder from his hand. I had a hunch of what was in it and I wasn't looking until he asked me to. I do. A long time ago this was where I started. Back when you could have a beer at lunch and nobody would bat an eye. I got a call about the situation and knew I had to come. This isn't the first time a kid's been taken. I opened the folder and sure enough there it was. Black and white photos of missing children in the woods. Ripped to pieces, entrails strung among the trees. Viscera which even in the faded ink was enough to make you sick. My old boss continued. We've taken trips to find it. No one's gotten a confirmed sight of the thing, let alone a kill. Sent 30 men, 50 yards apart with enough ammo to put down an elephant. All we got was two casualties and a scream that still gives me nightmares. The old folks thought it was some kind of demon. A curse on the white man for what our ancestors did to the natives when he sent them on the trails of tears. Can't say I blame them. I've seen how they live out west. We shipped blankets full of smallpox and slaughter, they send a monster in return. You sound like you believe it. I tried to joke, yet any humor fell flat on the stone face that glared with a knowing tired. He stepped closer, pointing at the photos, staring into my soul unblinking. I had to bury those children. Put on the rubber gloves to pick up the bits. Parents didn't have the stomach for it and couldn't afford a coffin. The fear in those dead eyes haunt me in my dreams. Now if you don't want to do the same, here's what I recommend. He gave me a list of instructions, the mother sobbing behind us now turning to an exhausted whimper. My pickup drove deep in the woods in wake of a setting sun. The camper shell and some tie downs kept the load I was hauling as even then it bounced while I drove down the beaten trail. The farther I went the less it looked like a road at all. First it was a lane, 
Then it was a footpath, then there was none at all. I hopped out of my vehicle as the sky turned from crimson to a cool blue. The last vestiges of light shimmering in the trees. I thought I was lost despite following his directions with certainty. 50 miles off the highway you follow the runner's trail. When it ends take a look around. If the woods are ready for you, they'll make room. I didn't know what he was talking about. Anyone else would have written him off as a loon. He trained me well however. Back when I was fresh out of high school kicking myself over a girl. He showed me the trails, taught me all the rules, even showed me how to shoot. My father died in the desert back in Iraq. This old man was closest thing to a dad I had. All in all, I owed him a little faith. I looked back at the gifts he left in my front seat. A pack of smokes and a flask with a small note unfolded. Reading it over again I felt the mix of pride and pity emanating from his words. I'd go with you kid but I'm too old. Seen too many corpses of my own. Just do exactly as I told you and you'll be alright. Help yourself to these when you're done. Congratulations kid, you're going to need them. I looked around, playing with the pack of smokes. I flipped the lucky cigarette upside down like my uncle showed me when I was young. Third from the left. We all know smoking is terrible for you. Even so, it's funny the things that old men leave to those behind them. I looked up, just about to head back thinking this was for nothing. Sure enough however I found what he was after. The thicket in front of me, a wall of saplings and branches now had a break. It started small yet as the sun went down and wind began to swell. The branches creaking as they gave way with all manner of twists and turns. It started slow. Slow enough you would have mistaken it for just the wind. In minutes however the way was clear. The very grass and weeds lay down along the path, inviting me further in. I hopped back in my truck and drove slow. I barely pressed the gas as the clearing squeaked me inside. I always heard the forest was alive. A great organism among the cells of bark and pine. I thought him drunk yet the old man was right. The woods made way to let me in. At the end of the path I found a clearing hid from civilization. There in my high beams was a cement flight of stairs. No debris from a house undone. No foundation to explain it being there. A lone flight of stone steps railed with an iron banister, curling into the night above. The steps ended sharp as they reached into the sky. Broken beams of iron pointing like curled fingers to the stars glimmering high above. The air had a severance to it, like stepping before an ancient temple. My hands shook as I stood before the stairway. Nothing prepared me for what I'd gotten into. And yet keeping my composure I walked around to open up the back. A corpse of a whole pig lay stretched across the truck bed. Its stomach hung open in flaps gutted as its blood seeped onto the tarp below. With all the strength I could muster I pulled on the tarp as it slid across the bed of my vehicle. It took five minutes before my efforts answered with the heavy thump of the carcass landing in the woods. Thank God the stink was minimal, the heat from the vehicle only beginning to let it turn. I dragged it still further before the steps, those stairs drawing me in with a strange magnetism. Inviting to see them more as the contrast of that cold stone was so stark to the woods around. Without thinking my hands even reached for it, yet the old man's words echoed in my head back from when I started. He was half drunk on a night watch for poachers back then, me too green to find it odd or even care. When he drank the demons would come to haunt him, or maybe they haunted him still. The man only drawing from his flask to numb their fingers on his shoulders. In one of his rants he told me plain. If you ever see a flight of steps here, don't even think of touching them. You'll never leave the woods alive. He pulled deep from the very flask now sitting in my car muttering to himself. I'm sorry Phil. I shouldn't have left you there to die. I never questioned it then. Now I saw everything with a cold certainty. I snapped back to my senses, pulling my hand away. I climbed in my truck, headlights glaring over the pig carcass before stairs that felt more like an ancient altar. I should have left like I was told. Leave the pig in front and don't come back till winter. Those were my instructions. 
That dead kid was still inside my mind however. The sad look in my friend's face as remorse weighed on his soul. I wanted to give those parents peace, every one of them. My hands gripped firm the weight of a cold iron. A black and gold revolver, with caliber large enough to kill a bear. I waited for that predator to snap at my bait, sure I was the one to put him down. I turned off my engine, quiet to lure him in. For an hour I rolled my thumb along the chamber of that gun. Waiting for the revenge I would take for all the murders it left behind. So sure that I would be their avenger. Certain that my act was one of justice and not of pride. It's funny, I only ever shot that thing at cans. The loudest scream I ever heard shattered the glass around me. My alarm blared filling those woods with the chaos that ensued. I screamed, covered in the broken bits of my windshield, but I did not run away. I did not cry or cower. Terrified still my actions were that of pure adrenaline. Stepping out of the safety of my vehicle I screamed into the night. Raising my firearm, blind and deaf to all that ensued. I had no idea where it came from, yet I fired that pistol in those woods. Again. And again. And again. Smoke from the burning powder filled my nostrils. Flash from a hot barrel blinding his echo and recoil had me stumble. My ears rang as the blasts mixed with the siren now behind me. I fired until my chamber went dry, and that was when it hit me. I turned to see an open hand of black across my face. Its claw wisped like smoke and shadow. Its color making even the night around us look bright in its comparison. The heavy thump of its strike knocked me down as though I'd been a child. My skull cracked against the ground and all went black around me. When I awoke there was blood across my eyes. Everything hurt as the world spun in my concussion. I reached for my face out of instinct as its painful sting awoke me. My fingers felt wet meat, dripping with crusted blood. I sat up unsure why I could not see. One I was full of haze and other I could not open. It wasn't long till I discovered I had no eye at all. The carcass was gone. Whatever that thing was had spared me, yet did not leave me unharmed. A warning to remember my hubris came in the surgery room, hours after crawling into my ride, finding my way home. Four long fingers on an open claw cut across the left side of my face. The index took my eye as its smallest left a scar across my neck. The last missing the vein that surely would have killed me. Forever I will be ugly. The scars from the flesh it tore unable to heal little more than the four canyon scrapes grinning like a Glasgow smile. I still work. Still walk through those woods. Still even make that drive once every season to that forbidden staircase. Dragging a pig or deer sometimes onto the dead grass that lay before it. Now I treat the place with the reverence it deserves. Leaving whatever roams these woods to its eternity. Ever since there hasn't been a single mauling. Just as there wasn't one in the years before. Some might call it sacrifice. Some ritual to appease an ancient god. Me, I don't know what to think. I just don't want to see any more dead kids. What I saw was definitely human, tall slender, maybe 160 pounds, with locally tufted fur hair on the cheeks and face. He was panting and appeared to be a male. He came around the corner of our house at the backyard area. Turned and looked directly at me. I had no sense of fear, in what could be termed a standoff. The dog man's eyes reflected, red light, from the retina just like a real dog. This experience came at a time of meditation in my life and was one of many other worldly experiences. This occurred about 20 to 25 years ago. The form was more human than dog and was bipedal. I worked night shift and a co-worker and I were both driving down a county road after work, probably around 4.45 am, still dark outside. I saw his tail lights get brighter like he was hitting his brakes, then he swerves down into the ditch line, and comes back out on the road and keeps going. As I approach the same area, I see this really tall, black figure walking in the road. It's moving in a very weird unnatural gait, 
Like it was kind of blowing in the wind, but it clearly wasn't. I first thought it was a really tall person wrapped up in a big black blanket because I didn't see any arms or head, just two big legs and a torso. I had to swerve over to avoid it too, but I basically came to a full stop, and the thing walks past my driver's window. It had to have been around 7 foot tall, as it was leaning forward and was at least a foot or so taller than the top of my vehicle. As it got behind my vehicle, I could see the taillights illuminating its legs, but couldn't make out any details like hair or anything like clothing. Just large, thick, black legs. I took off down the road once it was behind me and saw that my co-worker pulled into a gravel parking lot, so I pulled up beside him. He's freaking out asking if I saw it, and how it didn't have a head, and other ramblings. I said we should go back and try to see what the hell this thing is, because it seemed oblivious to us driving right at that. He didn't want to, but he ended up following behind me. We drove back the way we came in and around the same area, there was a large black dog laying across the road. This was not your normal size canine, it was much larger than any normal dog, but it looked dead. It wasn't there when we just drove through there less than three or so minutes beforehand. Anyway, I decided I was going to get out and go see if it's alive or not, and move it off to the side of the road because you can't really drive around it without going off the edge of the road on either side because the way it was laying across the road. As I get about 15 feet away, it raises its head up and looks back at me. Its eyes are glowing yellow, but I still say that was due to the vehicle lights causing I shine. It lets out a low, deep, rumbling guttural growl and I stop instantly. It attempts to stand up, seems like it has some sort of issues with its front legs, but it stands up and continues to stand up, on two legs. Like a person would. It only stood on its back legs for a second or two, enough time for it to look at me, but then it hunkers back down to what looks like on all fours and runs off to the wooded area. But there's a pretty tall fence there so I don't really know how it managed to disappear because it would have had to go over, under, or through the fence, or it just vanished. I also don't think it was using its front legs when it ran off, because I never saw them really moving. Now after all this, there was one last strange happening. My coworker gets out of his car after the dog thing ran off, and he comes up to me to basically say WTF was that, and as we are talking, I noticed a mouse standing between us. It was also on its hind legs, kind of sitting as it is washing its face. I nudged it with my shoe, and it doesn't even seem to care. Kind of like the first thing that was walking, it was completely oblivious to our presence. It just kept on cleaning itself. We left and went our separate ways. I woke up later in the day and started looking into werewolves and come across dogman stories. The only thing I will say about all of that is, this didn't have the hands and feet like is often claimed by witnesses. It had normal dog paws. It just had a large black wolf style look about itself, but its fur was really fluffy, which didn't really seem to match with the normal wolf type fur. It wasn't a bear, it didn't have mange, I know the difference between a bear or something like that. It just looked like a very large black dog. The first thing we saw, some people said sounds like a Fresno nightcrawler but those have been white in appearance, and not nearly as thick and tall. Someone recently asked if maybe it had wings and that's what was concealing its arms and head, as if they were draped around the front of it. I never thought about that before and can't say one way or another because I didn't see any sort of details on its body, just blackness. The way it moved just seemed very odd, otherworldly. I always think of those inflatable tube man that flap around in the wind at car dealers or some sort of events when I try to describe its movements. Just really weird. The mouse, that might the oddest thing to me because I physically touched it, so I know it was real, but it just didn't seem to care. It wasn't until recently I made the connection that all three of the creatures were on two legs at one point. Are they all connected? Who knows? I never saw anything like that ever again, and I only live about four miles from where it happened and I drive through that area often. I wish I had more answers but all I get is more questions. As someone who's been pretty skeptical most of my life, 
I've tried to explain it away in some logical manner but I can't. I have said the dog was playing with the mouse, must have got hit and its front legs were hurt, that would explain why it was walking on its back legs, and why the movement seemed unnatural. The mouse was traumatized from the dog messing with it, that explains why it looked all wet and why it was cleaning itself. That's the version I accepted for many years. The only problem with that is whatever was originally walking down the road was so much larger than the dog. When the dog stood up it was maybe six foot tall, but whatever walked by my window was at least seven foot leaning forward. The walking torso was also a lot thicker than the dog, as the legs were very thick, the dogs were normal dog legs. While working for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources in 2017 I was assigned to investigate sightings of a particular deer in the South Kettle Moraine State Forest along the Ice Age National Scenic Trail. The descriptions suggested that the deer suffered from chronic wasting disease, CWD. There were three different reports, each stating that the deer was malnourished, severely injured, and had a terrible odor. My first thought was that the deer had been wounded and that gangrene had probably set in. The part of the trail where the deer was reported was difficult to access with a vehicle so I ended up hiking. The sightings were near one of the public shelters. The most recent report was made about 24 hours previous. I reached the shelter just as a thunderstorm began to roll in. I looked around quickly for the deer but the rain started to fall heavily and I decided to wait it out in the shelter. The shelters in this area of the park are more like little cabins, and used by backpackers. I took off my backpack and sat down. I was soon overcome by the stench of rotting flesh. It came out of nowhere and it was so strong that I was nearly gagging. I looked around the interior of the shelter to see if I could find the source. Then I thought I saw something move past the doorway, but when I peeked outside there was nothing. The stench then disappeared as quickly as it had manifested. I waited in the shelter for maybe another 30 minutes. The storm hadn't let up but the stench suddenly returned. I didn't know what was going on but I knew there was something terribly wrong. I can't explain how I knew, I just knew. I then heard something scrape against the side of the shelter. It was loud. I looked out through the window and I saw what looked to be white antlers. Now that didn't make any sense at all. It was early summer here in Wisconsin and bucks don't start growing their antlers until much later in the season. Even if they were early they would still be covered in felt. I figured this must be the injured deer and it certainly smelled like it was on death's door. I tried to get a better look out the window but the animal appeared to be moving towards the door of the shelter. Whatever it was I was about to see it soon enough. I couldn't shake the feeling though that there was something off about this whole situation. I removed the gun, a 12 gauge shotgun with slugs, I had packed in to dispatch the deer. I pointed it at the door and I waited. The doorway was dark because of the storm but I could still see well enough to know that the creature that walked into view wasn't an old injured deer. It was about twice the size of a full-grown male whitetail and its body was absolutely skeletal. Its fur was long and stringy like the kind of long hair you would find on a dog and parts of it were missing fur completely. But the worst part was that its head was a skull. No hair, no skin, just bone with the antlers attached and I didn't see any eyes in its sockets. I could see it had a tongue in its jaw and its teeth looked like those of a deer but the lower jaw didn't appear to be hanging on by much and I don't know what the thing was. It was standing there in that dark rain-soaked doorway before I fired at it. I hit that creature three times center mass and it ran away. It was weird because it didn't fall down and it didn't even falter a step it just ran. I waited another hour for the storm to pass before hiking out of there. I had never been so scared in my life. If a shotgun couldn't stop it there was nothing I could do if I ran into it again. I finally reached my truck I had no idea what to report to my boss. I eventually decided to report that I never observed the deer. I thought that if I reported the truth it would raise red flags about my competence. Not long after that incident, I found another position within the department as a conservation warden.
My father grew up in the Pleasanton or Christine areas of Texas, which is about 20 to 30 miles south of San Antonio in the Texas Brush Country. The Texas Brush Country is a huge part of South Texas, it's not necessarily desert, but kind of a medium between the oak tree or cedar tree forests of the Texas Hill Country and the almost desert landscape of northern Mexico. Miles of wide open ranch land, with loads of thorn and mesquite trees, with some oak trees sprinkled in for good measure. Growing up, we'd go down and visit family members in that region, and when the sun would go down, I always felt creeped out by the area. There are some creeks that make you swear you were in Louisiana swamps, with large trees hanging over the creek beds, covered in Spanish moss and giving the areas a very creepy vibe, especially at night. It's well known that there are now lots of wild chili pekin plants along lots of the rivers and creeks in this area because when Santa Ana's army were making their way to San Antonio before the Battle of the Alamo, the soldiers had with them chili pekin peppers to make salsa and add spiciness to their foods when they would make camp, and naturally, lots of the soldiers would drop excrement along the creeks and the seeds of the peppers would find their way into the soil and begin sprouting the pepper plants. Anyway, one of my father's uncles claims he saw a large winged humanoid bird with glowing eyes swoop down on he and one of his buddies while out at the lake known as Choke Canyon, fishing for catfish late into the night from the bank, without a boat. The story goes that it was around 11 p.m. or so on a Friday night, and let's call my father's uncle Robert and his buddy Chester. The two men had decided to go fishing for catfish and drink some beers and enjoy the start of the weekend with a nice relaxing nighttime fishing trip to the lake, which was about 30 miles from the town they lived. So Robert, having worked in construction and having worked that entire day, was feeling sleepy and decided to nap in the truck while Chester stayed on the lake bank, listening to the radio and watching their fishing rods that were casted out in the water. Uncle Robert climbs into the driver's seat of his truck and falls asleep. An hour or so go by, and he's rudely awoken by Chester, who is screaming and pounding his fist on the passenger window of the truck, yelling like a madman for Robert to unlock the door to let him into the truck cabin. Jarred and caught completely off guard, Robert unlocks the door and asks Chester, who is out of breath and panicking, what the hell is going on? Chester, clearly panicked and freaking out, says to start the truck up and for them to get the hell out of there, he said that he was chilling in his folding chair, and had just caught a small catfish and had thrown it back into the water and had sat back down in his folding chair when he heard what sounded like a large bird flapping its wings behind him. He stood up and turned around and there was a bird-like humanoid, kind of like a large crane-like bird with a human face and a beak-like mouth, with glowing red eyes and a massive wingspan, something like 12 to 15 foot wingspan. So he turns around the seas this thing flapping just behind and above him and appeared to be readying to land right where Chester was sitting. These two were born and bred South Texas country boys, like my father, and had grown up in the brush country hunting birds, bobcats, alligators at that same lake, fishing and being common rural kids, so they had a lifetime of experiences with wildlife in that region and had never seen anything like it. Robert starts up the truck, and in the rearview mirror, illuminated in the red glow of the brake lights, Robert sees the large bird creature land behind the truck and begin walking around the truck over to the passenger's side. It was shaped like a man-sized crane, with thin long legs that looked like it would stand at a level with an average height man and it was the creepiest thing he'd ever seen. That's when Robert knew that Chester wasn't screwing around and he throws the truck into gear and peels out of there. They end up getting back Robert's place and Chester and he both decide to spend the night together, shotguns in hand, until morning, which is when they decide what to do next. They ended up going back the following day, armed to the tooth, to retrieve their fishing poles, folding chairs, and other fishing gear, and found the footprints of the whatever it was that they saw, still fresh and in the sand around their fishing spot. This happened in the 70s so it was before smartphones with cameras. When my father told me this story, I picture something like a tall shoebill, but there's nothing like that in that part of the state. Maybe it just wanted to eat the fish that Chester had just caught? Following the incident, 
they would end up eventually going back to fish in the evenings, but they would be sure to take firearms for protection. I'm 27 now but when I was 17, just weeks from 18, I lived in a small town in Missouri called Pierce City. I had saved up a good 4 years worth of paychecks and sold my TV to buy a used Suzuki SV650. It was my dream bike. I went and bought it and my father helped me get it to our home because I wasn't legally able to ride it for another few weeks. I remember when we got home I put it in our barn and locked the barn because we didn't have a garage. I don't remember why I did it though it's a very small town and we knew pretty much everyone and are hours away from the nearest neighbor. I fell asleep about 10 pm or 11 pm and woke up at 3 am because I heard a large bang near the barn. I thought it was one of the horses that might have gotten spooked or something, so I went out to check. I always carry a buck 110 folding blade and when I got to the barn it was still locked. There are no windows, besides one way at the top, but it's a good 15 feet high and there wasn't a ladder. I unlocked the barn and walked in and my new, used, bike was on the floor. I heard a crunching or chewing noise, so instinctively I grabbed my knife there was very little light just enough to reflect the polished metal. I peeked into the pin, and I kid you not, there was something squatted over the horse who it had to have killed as it was a healthy animal and we took good care of it. I've seen wolves eat animals before and it wasn't like that it looked like the thing off Lord of the Rings, the cave dweller thing but taller and I know it was only a couple seconds but it felt like minutes of me being frozen there. Whatever it was looked at me I turned and sprinted back to the house screaming. I swear it chased me. It ran on all fours and screeched like worn brakes on a heavy vehicle. I must have awoken my dad as he met me at the door with his gun loaded fired two shots in its direction and then shoved me inside and shut the door. It seemed scared of the shots and we later dialed the police, though they found nothing. If you guys live near there and have heard anything of it, please tell me. It still haunts me and I live nowhere near there now. This one happened to my great-grandparents on my father's mother's side. They lived on their small cattle and livestock ranch in Christine, Texas for the later decades of their lives. Christine is a super small town where everyone knows everyone and there's no need to lock your doors when you leave or when you go to bed. My great-grandparents were the warmest people you'd ever meet, always smiling, sharing humorous stories with friends and family. They'd take your coats or jackets when you'd enter their warm home and before hanging them up on their coat rack, they'd sneak a $20 bill into your pocket for you to find later. They were the kind of older couple who were always poking harmless jokes at each other in front of company to entertain you, super charming and loving, and always smiling and loving the life they'd built for themselves. Visiting them was always a treat because I grew up in the city, and when we would visit on a weekend, my great-grandfather would take my younger brother and I around the ranch to see the animals and livestock, pet the horses, feed the goats, and throw rocks into the stock pond. When we'd return to their house from seeing the ranch, my great-grandmother would have our favorite, breakfast for dinner on the table. Fresh hash browns, farm-raised bacon and ham, homemade tortillas, mild and spicy salsas, and fried eggs. And coffee, always with coffee, even if it was dinner time, and we loved it. So this story takes place during the 1960s, not exactly sure on the year, but my great-grandparents were in their late 50s, and their children, my grandmother, were all grown and had gotten married and moved out so at this point, it was just the two of them living on the ranch. They were on their way home from visiting some family in the south side of San Antonio, about 70 miles away. They had lost track of time so it was late into the evening when they left. So they're driving back home, to their ranch near Christine, TX, and on their route they have to drive over this wooden bridge that extends over a deep creek. I think sometime in the 1980s, a better road was paved into the town that no longer made it necessary to have to take this small dirt road and bridge from the Highway 16 to their small ranch. Several years ago, the wooden bridge was torn down and a new bridge was built using steel and concrete. 
Spanish moss hangs from the trees which really makes it creepy, and from what I remember, this bridge is about 80 feet long from end to end due to the creek it expands over being relatively wide, underneath the bridge is a good 30 to 40 foot drop down to the creek bed. For the most part, the creek is dry year around and only sees water flow during rainstorms. As my great grandparents are driving over this wooden bridge, their truck suddenly dies and comes to a stop near the middle of the bridge. My great grandfather starts swearing up a storm because he's tired, it's late, and they're still about 10 miles from home. He maintains his truck better than most and they had a full tank of gas, even the headlights and cabin lights shut off, so they were stuck there with only the moon bathing them and their surroundings in soft moonlight. My great-grandfather was born in the brush country of South Texas, so there's not much he hasn't seen out there, and in this situation, while most people might be a little intimidated to leave the safety of their vehicle, my great-grandfather was in his element out at night in what is essentially his backyard. Thinking it has to be a battery connection that came loose, my great-grandfather asks great-grandmother to hang tight, pops the hood and opens his door, stepping out into the cool night to check under the hood and hope to diagnose the issue. As he's struggling to see, fumbling with the battery connections under the hood, behind him he hears the sound of clip-clops on the wooden bridge, it sounded like steps of a hoofed animal approaching him from behind. He turns around and lets his eyes adjust to the dim moonlight to see what's making the noise. Maybe it's a deer, or a cow or a goat that's gotten loose from one of the other ranches in the area. Squinting, he's looking down the bridge and sees what appears to be a thin man, about five and a half feet tall, but with a set of very large ram horns on his head, walking upright, approaching him from the opposite end of the bridge. Its hoofed feet clip-clopping on the wooden bridge as it's steadily trotting towards him. A cold chill ran up my great-grandfather's spine and he quickly shut the truck hood and hops back into the driver's seat, slamming shut the door behind him and locking it. My great-grandmother, confused by his sudden reactions, asks what's going on, and my great-grandfather points at the humanoid that is slowly approaching their vehicle. She sees it, and reacts with what the hell is that? A goat? Watching it approach them and their vehicle. They can see that the horns on its head are very large, much larger than any ram or goat they've ever seen, but still cannot make out whether it has a ram or goat's head or a human's head. It's about 20 feet from the front of their truck when it hunches over and begins walking on all four of its cloven feet. They can only vaguely make out its features as it reaches their vehicle and begins circling them, my great-grandparents twisting and turning in their seats to watch it as it bobbing its head up and down, pacing around their truck. It doesn't ever touch their truck, it only slowly saunters around their vehicle, with the only sound in the night being its hooves clipping and clomping on the wooden bridge. Though it was dark, and difficult to make out its exact features, they both agreed that it had the body of a skinny bony man but with the head of a goat. They both said that the creepiest part of the encounter was watching its large horns bobble around the front and rear of their truck, unsure if it was going to do anything to them and how it felt like an evil or demonic entity, that they could sense it not being a normal animal, but a creature with evil intent. They hold their breath and don't know what to do and my great-grandmother, being very Catholic, begins praying quietly under her breath. On its fifth or sixth time walking around their truck, it stands back up on its hind legs and meanders towards the opposite end of the bridge from which it came, eventually disappearing into the black night and leaving them in the truck, frightened and shaken. A moment later, like clockwork, power is restored to their vehicle, and my great-grandfather starts the truck up and peels out of there making a beeline for their home, where they rush into the house and grab firearms, and spend the rest of the night locking all of their doors and windows and got no sleep that night. When we were younger, my cousins and I would go and visit what we believe is the same bridge, I'm not sure if this was the actual bridge where this apparently took place, but it was very similar, and we would park our truck, get out, and thrill ourselves by walking around out there after dark with flashlights and embrace the creepy ambience, armed with shotguns and rifles, of course. My great-grandparents never saw anything like that creature again, but from that night onward, 
My great grandfather always kept a loaded shotgun and a pistol in his truck. I live in Hautstuhl, Rhineland Pfalz, Germany. This occurred on June 4, 2017. I suffered a headache at around 11 pm. So I decided to go to bed. I entered my bedroom and my head began to feel heavy and my eyes began to hurt with intense pain. I got into bed and almost instantly I fell asleep. What seemed like seconds later I heard the TV and the PlayStation 4 turn on downstairs. Upon hearing this I thought maybe my wife was home from work. I realized that couldn't be possible because she didn't get off until later that day. Fully aware of what was going on, but obviously still tired, I tried to get out of bed but found myself unable to move at the slightest. Sleep paralysis had been common for me throughout life so at first I wasn't too worried but this was different. I began to panic and try to force myself out of this paralysis but every time I used energy I heard a voice inside of my head tell me to stop moving and sleep. I knew the voice wasn't my own because, at the same time, I was talking to myself in my head, almost yelling, saying, wake up now. This battle with the other voice, which almost seemed to control me went on for about 15 minutes until I finally had enough. I said a quick prayer and promptly rolled over onto my back trying to catch my breath when suddenly I saw it. Please be aware that the incident happened in a matter of seconds so I'm trying to describe it as best as possible. Directly in front of me on my window sill was a small figure. If I had to estimate it was maybe 3 feet tall. I did not see any eyes because the room was pitch black, but the silhouette of the figure was clearly visible because of the light that showed through the blinds. I believe it had its back towards me, one hand was raised and there was a bright blue almost white light that was casting through the window onto it. A quick flash was emitted and the being was gone, almost instantly that the being had left that my headache, I pain, and fatigue also left. This experience has truly changed my life. I have had other incidents in my life that now that I look back on after doing more research I believe were other visitations and or abductions. I appreciate you taking the time to read this and if anyone could offer me help or insight, I'd be very grateful. My father, who was working as a construction contractor, had a work crew leave a job site in a panicked frenzy once because they saw a Bigfoot-like creature in the creek behind the house they were working on. Happened at a house they were building a two-story garage at in the hill country a little bit north of Spring Branch, Texas. I think it was around 1998, I was around 9 years old, my brother was 6. The house that they were working on was on a piece of land way out between Blanco and Spring Branch. My father told us that the work crew called him from a pay phone at a gas station in Bulverde around noon, and told him they weren't going back to the job site until the following day because they were scared shitless and if it would be okay for them to bring some rifles and shotguns to keep in their trucks on that project until they were done. They were a no-nonsense group of Mexican and Honduran laborers, hard-working guys who would be at the job site from 8 a.m. until sundown busting their asses in the hot sun to earn a decent paycheck. Apparently, around lunchtime, after the crew had eaten and were resting in their trucks and in the shade of some of the trees, one of the guys went down to the creek behind the house to take a piss and explore the property a bit until it was time for them to get back to work. Behind the house was a sloped wooded area that led down to a nice little shallow creek. It was here where he said he saw what he thought was a big brown bear peeking around a tree at him. Naturally, he got a bit spooked and started slowly backpedaling to the house up the hill, trying his best not to make any sudden movements and to not take his eyes off of this bear. As he was making his way back up the steep hill to the house job site to where the rest of the guys were, the bear ran from behind the tree and darted across the creek and into the woods on the other side. That was when the worker got a clear look at it and saw that it wasn't a bear, it ran upright on two legs and had the build of a large man covered in dark fur. When he saw it run and realized it wasn't a bear, that's when he broke into a frenzied run to the rest of the guys, screaming at them to get into the trucks and for them to leave. 
they were a little thrown off by him but he jumped into his truck, and peeled off, and the rest of them saw how scared he was and quickly followed him in their other two trucks. Before doing so, however, I should explain that among the natives of Canada, both Indians and Eskimos, there is a shortage of marriageable girls. Probably a similar condition exists among the Sasquatch, thus explaining the action of the wild giant in this case. I should also like to add that although her present-day photograph hardly bears this out, the evidence of her contemporaries goes to show that in her girlhood, Seraphine Long was considered one of the most comely girls in her tribe. Here is the story, I was walking toward home one day many years ago carrying a big bundle of cedar roots and thinking of the young brave Qualic, Thunderbolt, I was soon to marry. Suddenly, at a place where the bush grew close and thick beside the trail, a long arm shot out and a big hairy hand was pressed over my mouth. Then I was suddenly lifted up into the arms of a young Sasquatch. I was terrified, fought, and struggled with all my might. In those days, I was strong. But it was no good, the wild man was as powerful as a young bear. Holding me easily under one arm, with his other hand he smeared tree gum over my eyes, sticking them shut so that I could not see where he was taking me. He then lifted me to his shoulder and started to run. He ran on and on for a long long time, up and down hills, through thick brush, across many streams never stopping to rest. Once he had to swim a river and then perhaps I could have gotten away, but I was so afraid of being drowned that I held on tightly with my arms about his neck. Although I was frightened I could not but admire his easy breathing, his great strength and speed of foot. After reaching the other side of the river, he began to climb and climb. Presently the air became very cold. I could not see but I guessed that we were close to the top of a mountain. At last the Sasquatch stopped hurrying, then he stooped over and moved slowly as if feeling his way along a tunnel. Presently he laid me down very gently and I heard people talking in a strange tongue I could not understand. The young giant next wiped the sticky tree gum from my eyelids and I was able to look around me. I sat up and saw that I was in a great big cave. The floor was covered with animal skins, soft to touch and better preserved that we preserve them. A small fire in the middle of the floor gave all the light there was. As my eyes became accustomed to the gloom I saw that beside the young giant who had brought me to the cave there were two other wild people, a man and a woman. To me, a young girl, they seemed very very old, but they were active and friendly and later I learned that they were the parents of the young Sasquatch who had stolen me. When they all came over to look at me I cried and asked them to let me go. They just smiled and shook their heads. From then on I was kept a close prisoner, not once would they let me go out of the cave. Always one of them stayed with me when the other two were away. They fed me well on roots, fish and meat. After I had learned a few words of their tongue, which is not unlike the Douglas dialect, I asked the young giant how he caught and killed the deer, mountain goats and sheep that he often brought into the cave. He smiled, opening and closing his big hairy hands. I guessed that he just laid in wait and when an animal got close enough, he leapt, caught it and choked it to death. He was certainly big enough, quick enough and strong enough to do so. When I had been in the cave for about a year I began to feel very sick and weak and could not eat much. I told this to the young Sasquatch and pleaded with him to take me back to my own people. At first he got very angry, as did his father and mother but I kept on pleading with them, telling them that I wished to see my own people again before I died. I really was ill and I suppose they could see that for themselves because one day after I cried for a long time, the young Sasquatch went outside and returned with leaf full of tree gum. With this he stuck down my eyelids as he had done before. Then he again lifted me to his big shoulder. The return journey was like a very bad dream for I was lightheaded and in much pain. When we recrossed the wide river, I was almost swept away, I was too weak to cling to the young Sasquatch but he held me with one big hand and swam with the other. Close to my home, he put me down and gently removed the tree gum from my eyelids. When he saw that I could see again he shook his head sadly, 
pointed to my house and then turned back into the forest. My people were all wildly excited when I stumbled back into the house for they had long ago given me up as dead. But I was too sick and weak to talk. I just managed to crawl into bed and that night I gave birth to a child. The little one lived only a few hours, for which I have always been thankful. I hope that never again shall I see a Sasquatch. That is Seraphine Long's story, the only one on record of a Sasquatch ever abducting an Indian girl. I could relate more instances concerning the wild giants of British Columbia, seemingly well-attested cases that I have collected over a period of many years, but in this article the few I have recounted must suffice. In December 2005 the witness was on his way home, near Norway, Iowa, late one night after work. He almost always walked the train tracks because they were a straight shot towards the house. These train tracks ran past an old settler cemetery that was alleged to be haunted. It's already dark and has been so for a few hours. There was no moon that night. As he walks near the cemetery, he starts hearing muffled footsteps behind him but doesn't think much of it. Plenty of other guys walk home this way as well. So he keeps going and the footsteps get louder and louder. About midway past the cemetery, he gets nervous and the steps are getting closer so he turns to look behind him. According to the witness he saw a goat man or the devil himself. He describes this thing as a man who basically had goat hooves and horns along the lines of the mythical pan. And this thing was heading straight for him. Reportedly all the snow around this creature was instantly melting as it walked through. The witness runs screaming like a banshee. He hears the clopping of the beast's footsteps behind him speeding up to catch him as he's running. Finally, he gets past the graveyard and sees the thing stop right at the edge of the cemetery. He continues running, stops to look back and the beast just vanishes. One of his older co-workers confided with the witness that there was a tale about a goat man many years ago. It was supposedly a Polish immigrant who disappeared one night but returned as the creature several years later. There had been UFO and strange being reports around the same time the man had vanished. My parents have told this story to me numerous times throughout my life and both of them and my older brother corroborate this story in exact detail. They seem genuinely terrified of what happened and they have told very few people about this experience. In the summer of 1990 my mom, 31, dad, 35, and brother, 15, attended an Aerosmith concert in Ohio. After the concert the three of them were walking to the parking lot and a huge crowd of people. My parents were standing on one side of the street about to step off the curb when they saw two hooded figures across the street. By the time their foot hit the pavement the figures were directly in front of them. They seemed to float without feet and moved from one side of the street to the other in an instant. The next thing they know they are standing alone, not in the exact same place that they were, with their arms outstretched from the elbow palms facing up and their hands and forearms are tingling. They made their way back to the car and no one else was around. The parking lot was empty except for their car. My brother was sitting on the bumper waiting for them and said he had been waiting for them for about two hours. My parents have no recollection of what happened during that two hour period. My brother says that he was walking and he turned around and they were gone and he just went back to the car and waited. Two weeks after this incident my mom finds out that she is pregnant with me. They believe this may be the reason they were approached. I personally have never experienced anything unexplainable like this but I do believe their story. I have never known them to make things up and they are not psychotic. They believe this encounter was some kind of extraterrestrial being. I believe their experience was genuine but I'm not certain that aliens are the explanation but I'm also not ruling it out. This happened in a post-concert crowd with hundreds of people around. Has anyone had a similar experience or any insight on what could have happened to them? I can still feel the icy grip of fear clawing at my heart every time I think back to that ill-fated hunting trip in the cursed woods of Kentucky. 
It was a day that would forever haunt my dreams, a day when my faith in the known world was shattered, and the boundaries of reality were pushed to their limits. The woods in Kentucky had always held a sinister reputation among hunters and locals. They spoke of strange happenings, eerie sounds, and an overwhelming sense of dread that seemed to permeate the very air. But for a group of seasoned hunters like us, stories of curses and ghost stories were nothing but campfire entertainment, until that day. We were a group of five, including me, Jake, the unofficial leader of our little expedition, and my lifelong friends, Mike, Tom, Sarah, and Mark. We had ventured deep into the heart of the supposedly cursed reserve, seeking the thrill of the hunt and hoping to prove that the legends were nothing more than superstitions. As the sun dipped below the thick canopy of trees, casting eerie shadows upon us, we decided to split into two groups, with each group pursuing different game, deer and ducks. It was in that fateful decision that our nightmare began. My group consisted of Mike, Tom, and me. We ventured deeper into the woods, our rifles at the ready, scanning the surroundings for any sign of prey. The air was thick with tension, and an eerie silence hung around us. Then, as we entered a small clearing, something caught our attention. It was a presence, a feeling of being watched that sent shivers down my spine. I exchanged nervous glances with Mike and Tom, and we silently decided to investigate. Our eyes widened in horror as we saw it, an unknown predator, a monstrous creature that defied all logic and explanation. It had to be at least nine feet tall, with shoulders as wide as four feet. Its stringy hair did little to conceal the bulging muscles beneath, which flexed with each movement. Its thighs were as round as tree trunks, and it had hardly a neck to speak of, with a head that tapered into a cone-like shape. Its long arm swung menacingly by its side. I would describe it as a half-gorilla and half-neanderthal man-type animal, a grotesque amalgamation of the prehistoric and the otherworldly. We were paralyzed by fear, unable to comprehend the monstrous being before us. Our rifles were clenched tightly in trembling hands, ready to fire, but the creature seemed to sense our presence. Its head turned slowly in our direction, and its eyes, dark and soulless, met ours. Time stood still as a shiver of dread washed over us. In that heart-pounding moment, the creature began to run, its massive form moving gracefully on two legs. Panic overtook us, and we opened fire, but our shots missed their mark as we fired blindly in sheer terror. The creature showed no signs of injury, and the deafening roar of the gunshots only seemed to fuel its relentless pursuit. In our desperation, we abandoned our rifles, the very tools of our trade, and ran for our lives. The woods, once familiar and inviting, had transformed into a labyrinth of shadows and horrors. We pushed through thick underbrush, our hearts pounding in our chests, our breaths ragged. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, we stumbled upon another group of hunters. Breathless and wild-eyed, we recounted our harrowing encounter with the unknown predator, but their skeptical expressions greeted our story. They dismissed our story as an overactive imagination or the stress of the hunt getting the better of us. But we knew what we had seen, what we had felt deep in our bones, a creature that defied all rational explanation a nightmare lurking in the depths of those cursed woods. After researching what I had seen on Google, I came across your YouTube channel associated with the words dog and man, along with Werewolf Ohio, several times. I am a sales representative for the Ohio, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania region, with an office in Cannon, Ohio. Being a city boy, it is often intriguing and interesting to be out in the country. With my job, I often find myself in new places and always see things I never thought I would. That was until Tuesday, November 23rd. On that day, I found myself following my GPS down a dirt road in Lisbon, Ohio, while listening to the local radio station out of Akron, ranting about the election. Suddenly, I spotted a man in a black fur coat running across a field. At first, he was about 10 feet away, and then, in what seemed like a flash, 
He was halfway across it before I had time to realize that this was not normal. I slammed on the brakes and grabbed my phone to take a photo, but I didn't have enough time to capture a good shot. The attached picture is what I managed to get, this creature was at least 7 feet tall and incredibly fast. It was entirely black, and I noticed what I later thought must have been a row of long, pearly white teeth as it ran. I distinctly remember two ears high on its head. It was definitely walking on two legs but appeared to be a giant dogman of sorts. Around three years ago, I was pretty down in the dumps. My long-term girlfriend just left me, I was back to living in my parents' basement, and to top it all off, apparently the world was supposed to end in a few months according to some old calendar. I bought into it, yeah. I was and still am, big on prepping for global disaster. Who knows what sort of shit could happen. I'd rather be safe than sorry. Anyway. I had been doing some pretty heavy research into Bigfoot sightings. Gigantopithecus? Dude in an ape suit? Some other undiscovered primate? Nobody knows. But I know it's out there, somewhere. I looked through page after page trying to gather as much information as I possibly could. I was determined. It didn't take me long to decide I was going to head out into the wilderness on my own and search for this elusive thing. I figured we all only had a few months to live anyway, what did I have to lose? I saved up some cash and went out to a sporting goods store to pick up some gear. A good tent and sleeping bag, as well as some other assorted camping supplies. I even nabbed some night vision goggles off of eBay. I was prepared, I was ready. I got a plane ticket to Washington State I'd read that's where a lot of the sightings were, and flew out there within the week. The plane ride was uneventful except for one very strange occurrence. After polishing off quite a few rum and cokes, F it the world's ending soon, right? I realized I had to piss like a racehorse. As I stumbled my way down the aisle, I suddenly felt every single passenger's eyes on me, even the ones who had sleeping. I mean, every single one, children included. I think I saw a friggin' baby giving me the evil eye. It was dead silent even though moments before the plane sounded like Mardi Gras. I kept looking back at the passengers when my hands found the bathroom door. They all had their heads turned around still pointing their dark gazes at me. I slowly turned my head around to find an old woman inches from my face. Her eyes were all white. Blood trickled from her nose. She grabbed me by face and pulled me closer still. Her rancid breath whispered something to me. Find us. We're waiting, the hag whispered. I practically threw myself into the bathroom and slammed the door closed behind me. What the hell was going on? Did I fall asleep on the plane and am now dreaming? Did somebody spike my drink and I'm now tripping out? Were the conspiracy nuts right, and the world is ending? It took me about 5 minutes to calm myself down. I wasn't a huge fan of flying to begin with let alone flying straight into a Twilight Zone episode. I decided to peek my head out of the bathroom to see if old Demon Eyes was still there. She wasn't. It actually looked normal again. I stepped out of the bathroom and walked back to my seat. Nobody was staring at me anymore. Had I imagined all that? I wish I could say that I had, in fact, imagined it all. But unfortunately, as I sat down, I noticed there was a small piece of paper in my seat. It was a business card. It was all white, plain, with nothing but an address on it, 237 Highway 12E, Packwood, Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. At this time, we'd like to ask y'all to please return to your seats and buckle up, as we'll be preparing to make our touchdown in beautiful Emerald City of Seattle. The plane taxied to a halt and I got off, eager to get the F out of there. I opened the map app on my phone and typed in the address from the business card. The app couldn't find the address, typical of that buggy piece of shit, but it did show me where Packwood was. I knew I'd heard of it before. It was a little town deep in the wilderness between Mount Rainier and Mount Saint. Helens, prime territory for Bigfoot sightings. 
I'd planned on going through there anyway on my way south, so I could stop off for supplies before heading into the forest. I turned the card over in my hands, and I shrugged. I figured, the hell with it, I'm out here for adventure, aren't I? Might as well check the place out. I got my bag, haggled with the rent car clerk for a bit, and started the two-hour drive south. I listened to the radio, the station selection slowly dying out the further I got from Seattle. For the last 20 minutes the only thing coming in was a single station playing old-timey music on an endless loop. The same strange tune, over and over, fuzzed with little bursts of static now and again. By the time I reached Packwood, it was starting to get to me. I thought I could hear someone whispering in the static. It was the middle of the night when I reached the town. I drove down Highway 12, noting the address signs as I went, looking for the address on the card. All the numbers were in the 13,000s. Whoever wrote down 237 must have made a mistake. I pulled into the Packwood Inn and went into the office. No one was there, just a few keys laid out on the counter and a handwritten note that said pay up in the morning. I grabbed one and opened up a room. I was exhausted from the long trip, and I plopped down on the bed. I messed around on my phone for a bit, thought about texting my ex-girlfriend, you said I should have more ambition? Well how about mother f Bigfoot hunting? I typed before deleting it, and I fell asleep. I woke up a couple hours later. It was still dark out. I have trouble sleeping in unfamiliar places, so I decided to just get an early start on the day. I went into the bathroom, pulled my shirt off to take a shower. I froze. I stared into the bathroom mirror, unable to process what I was seeing. The number 237 had been written on my chest in crimson red paint. I freaked instantly, jumping in the shower and soaking my bottoms in the process. The red numbers melted slowly into formless pink and red shapes. I fought down the panic as the shower warmed from its biting cold, and I scrubbed the last remnants of the numbers off of my chest. Someone had been in my room and somehow painted numbers on my chest, all without waking me up. I had no idea what this meant, but I knew it wasn't safe to hang around my room any longer. I hadn't unpacked much at all, and I grabbed everything that I had brought with me and hurried down the empty hallways. I passed the desk again, still empty, but the sign had been pulled down off of it, the only sign of another human I had seen. As I saw the lobby doors my hurried walk turned into a jog, and I stepped into the surprisingly crisp night air. I turned the rental car on to the same old-timey music. F that noise, I growled to no one but myself, turning the radio off with comforting decisiveness. Despite the lack of people, or maybe because of it, I felt watched. There was a full moon out and the clock in my car told me that I should be getting the benefits of dawn soon, so I kept the headlights off until I eased out of the parking lot and was back on the main town road. Back on Highway 12. I drove north. Although the technical area of Packwood was large, most of the buildings were clustered in the center near the inn and tourism centers, and as I drove with a slowly growing sense of tension I passed a church and then the only sign that I was still in Packwood were paths that cut into the trees and disappeared, side roads that lead to nestled houses in the forest. I should have just kept going, left the entire town behind. I didn't, something red flashed in the dim edges of my headlights and I stopped, mind whirling towards the numbers that had been painted on my chest. I suppose one thing all Bigfoot hunters have in common is undying curiosity and placing personal comfort and safety below the thrill of the chase. I gathered all of my survival gear that I had thrown in the back seat and put it on, just in case. I shone the flashlight around looking for what I had seen. The trees were marked. Marked with crimson paint. Unlike what had been on my chest, this paint was faded, worn away on the bark save for the well-preserved. You could still make out the shapes of the markings through the paint that was preserved in the cracks with a little effort. I knew from both my research on Bigfoot sightings and the brief search on Packwood I had done after receiving the address that the town had, for most of its history, been a lumber town. The industry had collapsed in the late 1990s, and the town's big lumber mill had closed down suddenly. 
These trees had been marked for harvesting but had never made it. Most were marked with simple X's, but my flashlight fell on red lettering. 134, not the number I had been given. But there were other trees. Not very many were marked with numbers, there were several 134's, but I saw a 222 and swallowed. My heart was racing now, and I jumped as the handheld radio in my pack suddenly crackled to life, the music nothing but broken words fighting to cut through static now. Find us. The words echoed and I felt compelled. I broke into the trees, abandoning the highway as I panned my flashlight tree to tree, searching and working deeper into the swatch of trees that had been marked. In my head I went over everything I knew about Packwood. Unfortunately my knowledge of its actual history mostly ended at the lumber mill, and most of what I knew revolved around Bigfoot sightings. Packwood wasn't exactly a mainstream destination for Bigfoot sightings. It had only really started getting any amount of significant sightings around 10 years ago, and even then nothing conclusive. Really you would only know to look for Bigfoot at Packwood if you were the kind of obsessive hunter that had already exhausted the mainstream spots, the kind that went into further and further remote regions, trusting success to slimmer and slimmer chances the more underground the better. I personally had even considered Packwood nothing serious. Not until the hag on the plane. The kind of hunters who no one was surprised went missing, the thought crossing my mind the same moment my light crossed a hulking pitch black pine, 237 scrawled across its trunk in fresh crimson letters. The radio was hissing static like whispers, and the phrase we're waiting we're waiting we're waiting droned through my mind. Once my light had found the one tree I saw another. There was a whole scattering of black pines, trunks twice as thick as the ones around them, a dense sleek black only marred by the bright red numbers on each of their trunks. Find us, we're waiting. And then, silence. The radio stopped. The whispers ended. It was nothing but me and the sound of the night, that all-encompassing quiet that steals all that you are into its own blackness. Until it was disturbed. I hardly noticed it at first. It grew slowly into my consciousness, a sound that I was familiar with but somehow didn't know, a droning, wispy sound. But not one I should have been hearing there. There was something behind the pine. From where I was standing, it was hard to make out. Its shape was near the tree, but it was bigger, longer. Man-made. I moved toward it, and suddenly the sound made sense to me. There, crashed and dilapidated into the middle of the trees, was an airplane. And suddenly the sound made sense to me. I was hearing an engine. It was torn and broken, but it somehow still seemed to be ready for flight. Its doors gleamed out like an invitation, and one that I wasn't going to dismiss. Curiosity, as it always does, got the best of me. I wrenched the door ajar, orange rust preventing it from moving any smoother. It was impossible to get in with all of my gear, so I left it by the door to retrieve it, just in case. The moment I entered, I knew something was wrong. I couldn't see or hear anything, but every other sense just felt. Wrong. The ground was wrong. The smell was wrong. Even the very air of it was wrong. I reached back through the door to grab my flashlight. I shone it around me, my immediate area at first, and then at the preceding aisles before me. And it was wrong. I was not alone on the airplane. Every single seat was full with crumbling skin and slack-jawed bones, buckled in as if it were just now making the descent. The strange thing was, they were all in different levels of decay. The remains of a dressed-up woman cradled a swaddle of death in her arms, while a fairly intact man with glasses studied an in-flight magazine. And, near the back, an old woman with a toothy, blood-stained grin stared at me. They all stared at me, every single one. They all watched me with dark gazes from eyes they didn't have, judged me with sneers of faceless expressions. Every face. Every aisle. Every seat. Every seat save one. It was empty, on the aisle, and strangely familiar. I walked to it, slowly, the empty eyes of every passenger watching me pass. It was labeled 37, but beside it, someone had painted a crimson too. 237. 
And then, I knew. I knew why it all felt so familiar. Why the plane was like a distant memory and the seat deja vu. This was my seat. On the plane, this was my seat. And this was my seat now. I sat down, and it was right. Just right. I buckled myself in, because safety first. My tray table was secure, but I was sure that any minute now the pilot would announce refreshments, and I would get a rum and coke and maybe take a nap. And their eyes weren't on me anymore because we were ready, up, up, and away. They were waiting. And I had found them. And then, 17 hours later, she found me. Her name was Deanna. She was a hunter, just like me. She pulled me from the plane and from the brink of insanity. She'd been out camping and found the numbers, followed them just as I had. When she heard the droning of the plane engine, curiosity got the better of her. That's when she found me, still in the seat. Still mindlessly staring into blissful nothingness. She brought me to her camp and then back into town. She left me at the bus station, and I never saw her again. I've always loved the woods. There's nothing quite like it, being in nature, the green and brown of foliage, the skipping rivers and streams, the bird calls and wind in the trees. A beautiful world alive with animals and plants, majesty around every corner from the smallest sprout to the tallest mountainous peaks. The whole forest is one community in a way, tree roots like hands holding each other beneath the soil, sharing memories unspoken. Ah. I'm sorry, I got a little carried away. I'm rather passionate about nature. Since I was a kid at church camp and I went hiking for the very first time I found myself a total outdoors nut. And earlier last year, I finally got my dream job. A park ranger position, at the biggest national park in Ontario, Pekasqua National Park, working at the northernmost HQ. When the virus hit it was hard for all of us. The park ended up closing to visitors. Luckily I kept my job. I ended up staying in the HQ for the first portion of lockdown with a few colleagues. Normally, national parks close to visitors for the winter, which obviously makes sense, it's the most dangerous time of year for hikers and campers. Quarantine kept us closed the entire year, so it wasn't anything new. Pekasqua is no different in terms of its closing policy. But it was different in the sense that some of us rangers ended up having to stay at the HQ over the winter. There was no fear of fire, obviously, we were shaping up for a frigid and snowy winter, but as I was confused about the reason, my co-workers didn't raise a fuss. They knew exactly what we were in for. I asked Chris what was going on and he looked at me with an expression like you don't know? Don't sweat it, Max, it's nothing to worry about. In the past we've had people jump the fence to get in during the off-season, so upper management just wants us to keep an eye out to make sure nobody gets in and gets themselves hurt. He assured me. I felt comforted by the sentiment, figuring it'd be a piece of cake. The only issue is that. I know this seems contradictory to my previous statement about nature. But I felt an uneasiness about the whole situation. Laugh at me all you want, but I've always had a sort of paranoia about winter. It's by far the most dangerous time to be outside, especially in a place like the forest. In the spring you fear the rain, being drenched and catching a chill, in the summer and early autumn you fear wildfires, and in all three seasons you fear the animals. But in winter? The cold alone is enough to kill you, being caught in a blizzard, or even just spending the night with no shelter. The thick layer of snow hides everything. One wrong step could send you falling into a frozen lake or a tree well. The animals are less of a fear, the bears are asleep in their caves and the wolves won't ever get close, but that only makes the place even more frightening to me. In winter the forest doesn't feel like a forest. The trees have shed their leaves and the animals are hidden away. It's deathly quiet out there, everything is muffled. The loneliness itches at you when you're out that far. The days feel like open mouths, it's only as the sun dips below the horizon that you truly see the teeth around you. I remember being young and asking my pastor why God would ever make winter, 
if it was so difficult for anything to survive in it. I didn't get a straight answer from him. But I digress, you understand what I'm getting at by now, ha. Huh? Suffice it to say I had my anxieties about spending the winter so close to the woods. I recall every morning waking up in my room, and although the presence of five other people in the HQ with me brought me comfort, feeling uneasy. I would get dressed in the morning, enjoy a meal cooked by Priya around a table with my friends, lace up my boots and zip up my coat, and then it would be time for work. I felt childish for it, but I would deviate from my path of patrol frequently to seek out my fellow rangers, sometimes to approach them and talk, but other times just to see them through the trees, knowing they were out there brought me peace. December was drawing to a close, it was Christmas Day at the HQ. We didn't all celebrate Christmas, Quinn is Jewish, Priya is Muslim, and Christopher and Bree are both atheist, but we still decided to do a gift exchange. It wasn't anything too fancy, just some trinkets to make the place feel more at home. We'd grown close to each other over quarantine, it only felt right. Being inside on that day, sitting around the wood-burning stove and giving each other our gifts felt. Right. We were in the midst of dinner when things went awry. The thud at the door caused me to jump. It was so out of nowhere that for the first few moments we didn't even move, just looking around at each other in confusion. It was Thomas who got up to check. We heard him swear from the door. That got us to move. On the front step there was a stag's head. The bloody stump was dry, but its fur was stained with rusty brown, eyes milky white and vacant. We'd all seen dead animals before, but we knew there was something wrong. I looked around at the others, but they all had knowing looks on their faces, albeit annoyed ones. Chris was the first to speak. It was probably a prank, someone might be out in the woods, he said. The others nodded. We should pair up and sweep the front entrance area, they can't have gotten far. Everyone began getting dressed for the outside. I looked over my shoulder longingly at our abandoned Christmas dinner, but I didn't complain, not wanting to seem selfish. Someone could be hurt out there, even if they had pranked us so cruelly like this I didn't want to think I might indirectly be the cause of someone's death via frostbite. I got to walk with Quinn, luckily. He's been here longer than most of us, second only to Christopher, about six years under his belt. We were walking down the trails rather than in the bush, the white beam of the flashlight making the fresh snow glimmer as we plodded through the thick layer of powder. We made small talk, quipping about the dinner, the presents we'd gotten from our co-workers and our family members in the mail, and the deer head. It got quiet for a moment, only the sound of the snow under our feet and the wind whistling through the pines. And then Quinn turned to me. Hey. Max? He asked. Um. Did anyone tell you about the year walk? I shook my head, giving him a confused look and slowing my pace. He sighed quietly, and slowed down with me, muttering in annoyance that no one had told me yet. Yeah, I thought so. You seemed confused when the boss let us know we'd be staying over the winter. What is it? I asked. He pursed his lips, trying to think of a way to explain it. It's an old Swedish tradition that happens around this time of year. People spend New Year's night walking through the forest until sunrise. Apparently they think if they do it they'll be given a prophecy about the coming year from a goat spirit, or whatever. I cocked my head, slowing to a stop. Okay? What's so important about it? From what I hear it's come back into style in some circles, he chuckled dryly. Last year some people jumped the fence into the reserve to do a year walk. They were half frozen to death when we found them. Luckily they survived, but you know. They. He trails off, as if he has more he wants to say, but he shakes his head. Upper management doesn't want to risk it happening again, so they told us to stick around over winter. We'll all get a bonus for it though, so that's A+, plus, A? Eh? He patted me on the back hard and I mustered up a weak laugh, even though that feeling of unease just continued to grow. The whole tradition reads as something. Demonic. Something my parents would have clasped their hands over my ears to keep me from hearing. It's. Intriguing. 
but I don't let the thoughts of it linger with me as Quinn changes the subject. We didn't end up finding anything. Neither did anyone else, except for Thomas and Bree. They found the deer's body in the snow, slumped against a tree stump and frozen, with footprints all around the clearing and leading off into the woods. That night I could hardly sleep. It wasn't about the deer, it wasn't about the year walk, and it wasn't about those footprints. It was about what I knew I'd have to do. Patrolling the woods at night, in the dead of winter. I don't know why it was frightening me that much. It shouldn't have been a big deal, it would be just like any other night patrol I'd taken. Only in the middle of winter. The idea of it made me feel queasy. I don't know if it's a true phobia, I know it's irrational, it's just a regular occurrence, a normal portion of the year and yet I couldn't will myself to sleep. It was in the wee hours of the morning. I still couldn't get any rest. Even though I couldn't sleep, I just laid there in bed staring up at the ceiling and tracing the wood grain with my eyes. I was shocked out of my trance by the sound of crunching snow and ringing bells outside. I sat up in bed, shuffling to the edge of the bed and looking out the window. Nobody there. The wind continued to whistle in the trees, and the forest was silent. Slowly getting to my feet, I wandered over to the window, and peered around. The crunching sound was quieter then, petering off to my right. When I looked down there were footprints in the snow under my window. I threw open the window and stuck my head out, looking out to where the crunching was headed. And there was nothing there. That didn't exactly help my predicament, only highlighted my fears and added a dark, unknown void to my paranoid anxious thoughts. In the morning I woke up and put on my clothes. I ate cereal for breakfast and chatted with Bree and Quinn, before we all put on our snow gear and got ready for our first patrol of the day. By the time we went outside there had been snowfall, washing away all evidence of the footprints outside my window. I try to keep my mind off it. We walk on our own during the day. It's bright enough we can find each other pretty easily, and we have walkie-talkies if anything goes wrong. I felt like I was being watched that day, but I couldn't place what I was being watched by. The day passed without incident, and so did the day after that. And the one after. Just three days until New Year's, and my anxiety continued to mount up. I asked Christopher if I could stay in and file our incident reports. He let me spend one day inside, thank God, but. When they were out in the woods doing patrols, I could hear the crunch of snow and ringing of bells again, circling around HQ. It happened again the day after when I was lagging behind to wash the dishes after everyone had left. It happened each night too, walking around and around. I was sure I was just hallucinating, or my mind was playing tricks on me, but despite myself I couldn't shake that feeling of dread. I prayed for the first time in years that night, clasping my hands together and quaking in my bed, praying I catch a cold or break a leg, anything for an excuse not to patrol that night. On the morning of December 31st, I woke up an hour ahead of schedule. I crawled out of bed and wandered to the bathroom in my pajamas, splashing water on my face. My head hurt so badly. My knees buckled under me and I wrapped my arms around the edge of the toilet. I tried not to look at my vomit, eyes squeezed shut and stomach lurching as I lost last night's dinner into the bowl of the toilet. My anxiety had reached its peak. Even breathing turned into gasping, wheezing hyperventilation, hysteric sobs escaping my choked throat. I pressed my hand over my mouth, digging my fingers in to keep anyone from hearing. The bathroom felt more like a confession booth, claustrophobic and closing in on me, judgment from the other side of the door even though I knew nobody else was awake. I, I put on my clothes. I had no appetite for breakfast, and when everyone woke up, I acted as though nothing was wrong. I kept up my chipper attitude, I picked at my lunch, I filed more incident reports. And night time finally came. The snow was thick and cold. I could see all of the stars in the sky. The patrol began according to plan. I was paired up with Bree. We talked, but I wasn't much for conversation. I was too busy letting my fear get the best of me, my eyes darting around and my hands shaking under my mittens. I couldn't bring myself to look at Bree, 
fearing that she would notice the fear in my expression. After a while the conversation petered off and we were walking in silence, sweeping our flashlights around through the trees. After a long while of silence I cleared my throat, and looked too. Bree. Bree wasn't there. I spun around in a circle. Bree wasn't there. Bree wasn't there. She had just been there, just a few feet behind me but. I looked around again. Everything looked different, I'd walked this patrol path dozens of times, over and over, but nothing looked right. The trees were all wrong, stretching up high into the night sky. There was no sound, just the crunch of footsteps and the whistle of the wind. I could feel my heart rate picking up, I could feel my breathing begin to quiver and rattle in my throat. And then my flashlight fizzled out. And I started to shake. I fumbled my walkie-talkie off my hip and tuned it to the right frequency. T this is Maxwell, asking for backup, is anyone there? I stammered into the receiver, voice cracking pathetically. All I got in response was a garbled static sound, no matter what I did. I repeated my message over and over, until my voice had dissolved into babbling whimpers and I fell to my knees in the snow. There was no response. Just a superlative fear and loneliness that hit me like an oncoming train. I curled into a ball, hyperventilating and crying into my knees as cold crept in on me. My jacket kept me safe, but still I could feel the cold on my face. I don't know how long I stayed there, paralyzed with fear and unable to move an inch, just praying to a god that I knew couldn't hear me to let it all be a terrible nightmare. I heard a sound then. Ahead of me, the crunching of snow. I looked up. In the path ahead I could see a figure walking away from me. I was up on my feet and running after it in an instant. I called out, my voice still hoarse and raw from crying yelling for them to stop and wait. They just kept walking. Even with their slow pace I just couldn't seem to catch up. My hope made me reckless, I didn't notice the route in front of me, and I stumbled forwards, falling face down into the snow. When I looked up, the figure was gone. I shakily got to my knees in the snow and stared forwards if looking long enough would make it come back. I could hear ringing behind me, but I couldn't bring myself to turn around and look. The two of them walked past me, two women wearing traditional-looking Scandinavian dresses and white veils. In one hand they each carried a swaddled blanket drenched red in blood, and in their other, a bell, ringing with each step. They left a bloody red trail in their wake, droplets of blood in the snow from there. Children. They spoke blankly, without any tone, speaking in a language I couldn't understand. Ara till good for Detta Barn. Ara till good for Vara Barnes Valsinels. Vitar med dem till Hanum Akaterlamner Hans Gava. Her Valsignate are Vi for VRT Bidrag. I felt sick, I felt my hands grow sweaty and my throat closed up. I, I followed them. I got to my feet and trudged after them, unable to cry anymore. There was a river ahead, rushing across the path and splitting it in two. I kept walking. The two women walked to the river edge, and let their children fall to the ground, blankets falling open full of nothing but bones and mulch. I started hearing other people walking in the woods, taking their own paths, all converging on one point. I didn't run towards them no matter how much I wanted to, I couldn't bring myself to change course. It was a trance. I know that now. But I didn't understand then. In the middle of the clearing there was the monument. It wasn't supposed to be there. Nothing was supposed to be in the woods. There should have been nothing there at all, but it was. A pillar of wood with a stag head on top, a spike through its skull to keep it in place. At its base was the body the head had once belonged to, split open to expose its innards. Steam still rose off of it, it was fresh, still warm. There were others in the clearing, all standing at the ends of their own pathways, staring up at the monument with adoration. The deer head's mouth gaped open, tongue hanging out and eyes rolled up to show whites. It began to speak without its lips moving. Kam frame at Mina Barn, din gud har val sign at os med kropanov sin in fadi son. Var glad, for dead abroad som han har get dig ar en helig prophetia. 
Glad dig ock at. It groaned out in joyous suffering, its blood dribbling down the pillar in beads. I didn't understand. But the others there did. They scrambled forwards through the snow, dropping to the ground in front of the body of the deer and pulling fistfuls of gore and bloody guts out of the animal's body with wet tearing sounds. I felt sick, I felt terrified. I felt so hungry. I sank to my knees in front of the body and reached forwards. The parts were indistinguishable from each other, mashed together and disgusting. Tears streamed down my cheeks as I shoved pieces of raw deer flesh into my mouth, metallic and chewy and textured in a way that made me want to vomit, but I just kept eating. Why was this happening to me? What was I doing there? I sobbed into my bloody handfuls of venison, leaning down and beginning to tear at it with my teeth, licking the blood off my lips. If there was a god to hear my screams for help, it was cruel enough to turn away. Shame and guilt and fear roiled around in my stomach, and the moon shone down on me like a spotlight at its highest point. The world shrank around me until nothing but the body of the deer and the monument were real. I leaned back, blood drenching my face and hands in front, staring up at the deer head as it stared back at me. Duaran or Lunda. Duvar into tanked coma hit. Men do are valsinid. Du far and gava. I didn't understand. I couldn't understand. I kept eating, even as I cried. Lightheadedness set in. I staggered to my feet and stumbled away from the clearing, weeping openly and staring at my bloody hands. What have I done? What's happened to me? I am a monster. I couldn't run, just stumbled away as much as I could, tears and mucus mingling with the blood that coated my face. I fell to the ground, and sobbed into the snow. I covered my ears when I heard people screaming from the clearing behind me, and curled into a ball to hide when they ran past me in their new forms, hoofs leaving bloody marks in the snow. I splayed out where I laid, and even the silence that fell over the forest was deafening, ringing in my ears. I could hear it now, I could hear everything I couldn't before. I could feel the cold forest pumping and beating as one, screaming as one truly living, breathing being despite the snow cover. A being that would consume my body to support it just as I had to the body of that deer. Oh God! There couldn't be a God, this breathing, amorphous being was God, a frantic and hungry God, a spiteful and ancient God. It was everything and I was part of it. Oh God! Oh God! I must have passed out. When I woke up, I was laying on the trail I'd been on with Bree, and Priya was shaking me awake. She looked terrified, and I didn't understand why at first, until. I noticed the blood all over me. It was. Real. Then. Priya helped me to my feet and I leaned against her heavily on the way back to HQ. They asked me what happened, and I told them I couldn't remember anything. They were so worried for me, but. They didn't seem surprised at the outcome. I think I was just like those people from the year before when they found me. I'm getting a few weeks off. I can't return home, Ontario is in lockdown again. I spend most of my time in HQ, and the others try to console me. It makes me happy to know they care, but. Nothing feels right anymore. I can't walk in the cold woods anymore. I can hear the trees moaning hungrily when nobody else can, and I'm one of the lucky ones. When I look out the window to the tree line I can see the deer with human eyes pacing and drooling red, jealous that I was spared when they weren't, even when I never wanted this gift. And when I sleep I can feel the forest itself breathing, more alive than it's ever been. The air hung heavy with a sense of foreboding as our special forces unit descended upon the abandoned asylum in rural Kentucky. The place had a dark history, and rumors swirled about the unspeakable horrors that had occurred within its decaying walls. Our mission was to find a man working for the Secret Service who had been kidnapped by a local nationalistic gang. We knew this wouldn't be a routine operation, but none of us could have anticipated just how harrowing it would become. As we approached the asylum, the eerie silence of the surrounding woods amplified our apprehension. The moon cast long, 
sinister shadows that seemed to dance in time with our racing hearts. We were professionals, trained to handle the worst of situations, but there was something undeniably sinister about this place. Our point man signaled for us to halt, crouching low as he surveyed the perimeter. Suddenly, a gunshot pierced the night, followed by a barrage of return fire. The gang had caught wind of our approach, and the shootout began in earnest. Bullets whizzed past us, and we quickly took cover behind trees and rocks. The crackling of gunfire filled the air as we encircled the asylum, trading shots with the gang members who defended their hideout. We knew we had to break inside to rescue our captive, but it wouldn't be easy. The gang was well armed and determined. With a coordinated assault, we breached the asylum's entrance. Chaos ensued as we moved through the dimly lit, decrepit hallways, taking down some of the gang members while others escaped deeper into the building. It was a gruesome battle, with no shortage of close calls, but we pushed forward, driven by our determination to complete the mission. As we progressed deeper into the asylum's bowels, we encountered a series of locked doors, each one more forbidding than the last. It was during this tense search that I stumbled upon something that defied reason and sent chills down my spine. In the basement, hidden behind a rusted steel door, I found a room unlike any other. The air grew colder as I approached it, and a sense of dread washed over me. My heart pounded as I slowly turned the handle and pushed the door open. What I beheld within that room will haunt me for the rest of my days. It was about eight or nine feet tall, a shadowy figure that defied comprehension. It had two long, spindly legs, arms even longer that reached the ground, a round body, and a neck that seemed impossibly thin. But the most unsettling aspect was its complete lack of a face. There was nothing there, just an abyss of darkness where a visage should have been. Before I could react, the creature lunged at me with unnatural speed and strength. I stumbled backward, my heart racing, as it passed through the window, shattering the glass. I watched in shock as it disappeared into the night, leaving behind only shattered glass and my own shattered sense of reality. I rushed to follow the creature, my instincts driving me forward despite the overwhelming fear that gripped me. But it was as if the thing had vanished into thin air, leaving no trace of its presence. I returned to my unit, shaken and breathless, to recount what I had seen. I described the creature in vivid detail, but my comrades exchanged skeptical glances. They didn't believe me, and I couldn't blame them. The asylum had been a nightmarish place, and our firefight with the gang had been harrowing enough without adding tales of faceless monsters into the mix. As we completed our mission and rescued the kidnapped man, the memory of that creature lingered in the back of my mind. I knew what I had seen, even if no one else believed me. It was a reminder that sometimes, the horrors that lurk in the shadows are all too real, even in the world of the elite special forces. This happened at my childhood home in Connecticut when I was 8 or 9 in November of 2010. It was like 6 p.m. and I was getting ready for bed and my parents were across the hall folding laundry and stuff like that. As I was getting my pajamas on I glanced up at the skylight above my bed and as I did two hoof legs smacked against the skylight and my heart dropped like I had an instinctual feeling to be scared of whatever it was and I'll never forget the noise it made when it hit the window that's how I know my mind wasn't playing tricks on me. The legs also had no fur or skin just muscle and veins it also looked like whatever it was tried to climb up onto the roof but could only get its legs up before moving away. I ran into my parents' room crying and trying to tell them without sounding like a paranoid little kid, of course they didn't believe me. After that I refused to sleep in the room and I slept on the couch up until my parents divorced and I moved out of the house. Still creeps me out to this day. Let me start this up by saying I've never truly believed in ghosts. I never wanted to nor drew any interest into believing in the paranormal, until me and my wife moved into our new home at the start of the year. We live in a nice area, the house isn't too old and we are in Michigan. When we first moved in, 
there was absolutely no reason for us to believe it was haunted. About two months went by and we started to experience things that could be written off as natural, such as lights turning on, electronics turning on or off, or curtains moving. We blamed it all on faulty electrical wiring or breezes, and didn't think too much of it, other than making a few jokes about it being haunted. Gulp. Eventually, things escalated, and boy did they escalate quickly. The first big encounter we experienced was our bedroom door slamming shut while we were watching a movie downstairs, and it was loud enough to rattle the paintings on the living room wall, so of course we ran up to check what happened. When we opened the door, the bedding was off our bed when it originally was tidy, and the curtain pole had fell off the window, we didn't think much of this, as we believe it fell off due to the door being slammed, since our paintings rattled downstairs, but worth a mention. We got spooked by this, and this would happen regularly. It was never a different room, always the main bedroom. Door being slammed during the day and at night, things being in places we didn't leave them, pillows on the floor etc. Before I mention this next part, I just want to ensure you know my wife has never ever experienced sleep paralysis in her entire life, until one night in April where she woke up and saw a tall figure, that resembled a human, but wasn't. The figure didn't move, she described it as just standing still, watching in the corner of the room. This freaked her out enough that she woke me up and we both had to sit and watch a movie till she could feel comfortable enough to fall asleep. Things didn't stop there, they got more aggressive. We haven't been physically harmed yet, but things would be thrown. Paintings dropped of off walls, pillow thrown across the room again, bottles of deodorant being slammed off of walls, it is to the point where I am mentally drained of coming home from work and knowing there is a huge mess to clean up. What can we do? What is this thing that is doing all of this? And why? Our house isn't that old, I'd say the 60s or 70s, we live in a nice area, why would it be haunted? I'm hoping I get closure here, and I understand most people won't believe anything I've said here, but we are so so mentally drained, and we can't afford to move. Please. Help us. I fear things are only going to get worse, and physical, is this a warning? Is it just getting started? Anything, any help. My parents are from a small pueblo in the Sierra Madre Mountains in Oaxaca, Mexico. Over there, it's very rural and secluded and surrounded by bosques, forests. To get a sense of what I'm talking about, Google, San Pedro, Yolox, and you'll see what I mean. Growing up, my parents would always tell me stories of supernatural occurrences they or their family would encounter. Over there, people accept this as fact not fiction. It's not unusual to hear voices calling your name at odd hours of the night, hear dogs scrimmage outside and cry in fear, or hear weird tappings or knockings outside your door. The locals warn of staying out at night for too long, venturing too far out into the wilderness, or visiting rivers alone. As a young boy, my father would accompany his dad to El Rancho, the ranch, which was far away from town. One day, as he was playing outside in the fields, he saw a tiny figure a few meters away from his. This figure had elven-like ears and looked like a small child. It was beckoning my dad to follow him. My dad had heard of these beings before, parents warned their children of these beings, and so ran to his dad. My grandfather immediately believed him and grabbed his rifle, asking my dad where he saw it. My dad pointed in the direction where he saw it and my grandfather ran out and loaded his rifle, threatening the being not to come closer or harm my dad. After hearing very similar stories of these beings from relatives and my parents, I wholeheartedly believe they are telling the truth. There's something out there, and I hope that one day we open our hearts and minds to learning more. For clarification, I saw it in El Paso, Texas, and the women who was investigating it was somewhere in the Midwest. Allow me to explain the situation. Two or three years ago, I was on Reddit using a different account, and I was bored, I happened upon a post that intrigued me greatly, 
It was of a young woman who was investigating a tunnel that was said to be haunted. She had investigated this with her friend and found strange sigils across the area, and even dreamed some up, I decided to join the mystery and assist them, but misfortune was clearly on their side. I got her Instagram, and she would send me pictures of what she would find. Various darkish anomalies in the background of the area, and a photo her friend took of a ghost which had began stalking her, the friend, ever since she started helping her. The being was completely black and abnormally tall, and his face was like a pale moon. All I knew at that point was that this could be something like an ARG. It wouldn't be long after that I encountered the same being, I was walking around in my house when it manifested out of a closet and stared at me, I felt it, so I turned around and stared back. And it floated back into the closet. I was too scared to check, so I just stood there and I immediately backed out of any further investigation, and left it at that. As of then I've not had any encounters with it. The whole thing still creeps me out to this day, and I've been searching for answers ever since I've gotten the opportunity to do so. For those wondering as to why I waited so long to make a post and tell the story, let it be known that I didn't want this thing going after me, it intimidated me and I admit that. I was only 14 when it happened and I was scared of the consequences. And in the further years stuff started happening that required more of my attention. Which eventually lead me to assume that this was just something I'd have to take to my grave. All I ask is for closure, what did I really see that day? A bit taller than a Barbie doll creature that looks human, and though they may be wild, they are well dressed akin to the styles of the 17 or 1800s. Several years ago I clearly watched a well dressed young man slide down a bit of old house siding at the back of my yard trying to escape my attention, and he left a skid mark in the dirt that my intelligent husband couldn't explain away as a mouse or chipmunk because there were bipedal shoe marks, footprints, also left behind. And though my husband was a firm skeptic he later had his own clear sighting of a well-dressed little man that was older and looked to my sighting. I, we, don't know what to call these people, but I'd like to find a specific forum in which to discuss them. Currently, I concern about the hard heat wave we are about to experience. I added water sources in the yard or garden tonight and tried to express the situation aloud to them. I can only hope my little neighbors benefit from my efforts. But I would like to discuss such things with others who know about them and care to share our world. I seem to be able to assume this forum is a place to post real observations and concerns with trust. Where do I go? Where do we turn? Because we know these folks are here without a doubt. We want to be good neighbors, and would like to connect with others who make such efforts to learn what they like, need, want, dislike, etc. This is in North Central Indiana, USA sightings are infrequent but ongoing. My husband swears he recently sighted two little men while backing out the car, but when he turned to look directly there were only two robins. He's also seen them shift into squirrels. He's not teasing me or joking. He 100% believes what he'd seen as an eye with my own sightings. This happened in about 1990 in southeast Michigan. Twice I saw a tall, black humanoid-shaped figure that ran like the wind and appeared to almost fly across the ground. Both times it was dark out and both times it scared the hell out of me and the friend I was with. I was with two different friends. One at the first sighting and the other at the second. They both saw it too. Back up about four years before I saw this creature. A friend of mine was killed riding a mini bike. My brother and I were getting cryptic phone calls from someone our age who wouldn't tell us his name. I can't remember what he'd talk about but it was really creepy. One day I hung the phone up and my brother asked who it was. I told him he wouldn't say. My brother guessed it was the kid that died. Then in 2002 I go see the movie and man did it give me chills. Nothing bad ever happened to me my friends or the town but besides that we experienced the same thing as West Virginia did in the movie. Anyone else experienced this before?
When I was about 16, I wasn't feeling the best one night and decided to go to bed early. Sometime during the night, I woke up out of nowhere and was feeling really groggy, but at the end of my bed I saw a shadow that looked to be wearing a cowboy hat or one of that shape. There's a window across from where my bed is and the curtains were closed but the moonlight was shining through very faint, so I could just make out the shape, I couldn't see any features. When it happened, for some reason I wasn't scared, I just thought it was my brother for some reason, but maybe that's because I was half asleep. I just asked why are you in my room and he didn't say anything, he just slowly moved back a few seconds after towards the corner of my room which was completely black until I couldn't make it out anymore, it's like it just faded into the darkness. Right after this I just fell asleep again and looking back I don't know how I could. I woke up that morning and the first thing I thought of was what I saw and that's when it hit me how stupid it would be for my brother to be in my room that late wearing a hat. I asked everyone in the family if they were in my room and of course no one was. I thought I might have been dreaming but I clearly remember waking up with a headache and still being half asleep and the fact that I remembered it that morning and the feeling I got in my heart when I realized what happened, especially considering I can never remember my dreams. Any thoughts? Edit, this was in Ireland around 2016. This was about 16 to 17 years ago, but my brother, myself and a couple friends were out driving around on a country road one night around Jefferson County, Indiana. It was about 2 a.m. and we were heading back to our house when this creature ran in front of the car. It was probably about the size of a chimpanzee, white fur, long arms with the head shape of a canine. This thing is burned into mine and my brother's memories, and the memory of two of the other people who were in the car that night. I'm curious as to if anyone else has seen or heard of anything like it. I've poured over numerous posts and articles about cryptids and can't seem to find anything that really matches it. Also weird point but the way I always described it was if the mongoose bike mascot from the 90s was a real creature. Edit, a lot of people have suggested dog man, I don't think it was. This thing was short, maybe 4 feet tall, like I said body similar to a chimpanzee, very muscular, and could most likely walk bipedal but while it ran was using its arms as another set of legs. This happened many years ago. I lived Maryland in a little suburb type community. My bedroom faced the road and my parents faced the backyard. We lived in the middle of a cul-de-sac so you could see a lot from my bedroom window. Late one night, I got up and headed to the bathroom. When I got back in bed, I heard knocking at my bedroom window. I was on the second floor so I knew no one was knocking on my window. I thought it must have been my cat. I rolled over and tried to fall back asleep. There was more knocking, only this time there was a pattern to it, like shave and a haircut. So this was definitely not my cat. It was from outside, my door was on the other side of the room so it wasn't anyone inside. I got out of bed and went over to my window to look outside. At the end of the street was a light post and a giant oak tree next to it. This little creature, Looked like a real live version of Danny DeVito's penguin but not so dirty was dancing under the light post. It grabbed the pole when it realized I was looking at it spun around it and jumped to the side and disappeared as his feet clapped together. It was super weird. I have no idea what it was, I've never seen it again after that. Not too much longer after that sighting, my mom passed away, by her own hand. So I don't know if he had something to do with it or if it's just coincidence and I'm still trying to place blame after 26 years. This happened in maybe 2015-ish, in Ohio. I would be 16 at the time. My friend and I were walking home from a local park, on the side of a somewhat busy street. Suddenly, I saw a glimpse of something sprint across the road and over the guardrail ahead of us. The other side of the guardrail is a steep hill and densely wooded area. He asked me if I saw that, and I was even more creeped out. He saw it too, and we both described almost exactly the same. 
It looked bipedal but seemed to be running on all fours, had what looked like grayish white hair all over its body, and was fast as hell. We got up to where it would have been on the road and saw nothing on the hill or in the woods down below. We kept looking around but saw no sign of anything, before we just agreed that it was really weird and kept walking. About two years ago, I lived in an old house outside of city limits in western Alabama. Wild hogs are considered a nuisance in this part of the country, and thus are year-round game. The land wasn't mine, but it was legal hunting ground, so my landlord gave me and my friends explicit permission to take care of any hogs we came across. So a lot of the time, especially during the winter when this encounter took place, I was posted up on my back porch with a cigar and a gun, either by myself or with company. This land wasn't very clear, in fact we only had about 20 feet from the porch to the tree line, then it would go down a hill and the brush would get thicker. So our hunting was just being quiet and looking for the beady eyes of hogs in the foliage when we heard rustling. So, all that being said, one night during my porch sitting, I heard some rustling. I started scanning the woods for this hog, and eventually did come across a set of white, beady eyes. They weren't a hog's eyes though, because these were eye level with me. As my eyes continued to adjust, the rest of the creature started coming into view. It was tall, thin, and had long, spindly arms and legs. Its entire body was completely black. I couldn't make out any other facial features besides the eyes, but what I could make out was that this thing was actually a good ways down the hill, so the fact that it was still at eye level with me meant it was likely around 10 feet tall. It started up the hill, moving towards me, and I had this feeling in my gut that .45 caliber bullets probably weren't going to do much here. So I slowly collected my things and headed back into the house. It didn't make any sound as it moved, other than the slight crunch of leaves. As it climbed the hill, it somewhat stopped at the tree line, then turned and walked along the edge of it. It bobbed and lurched a bit as it walked, kind of how some large birds bob their head as they move. That was the most terrified I had been in a long while, and as the title says, this wasn't the only encounter. My hunting buddies and I all saw it several times, walking through the trees a good bit away from the house, sometimes turning to look at us. My roommate that moved in later that same year once walked outside and saw it right up against the porch, looking right down at her. It never tried to attack anyone or even acted aggressively, so we eventually stopped being as scared, though still very cautious, and started calling him big boy. I've told a couple other friends about this. One of them said the description and behavior matched something called a California Dark Watcher. I did my research, and as much as this creature matches up, this was on the opposite end of the continent. I'm still not 100% sure what it was that I saw, but I am 100% sure I saw it. Multiple people did. Edit, typos, and also forgot to mention that the woods went completely silent every time we would see it, even the bugs. Things normally get quiet when there's a predator in the area, but I mean complete and total silence. Edit too, alright. You guys talk me into it. Give me a couple weeks, and I'll be back out there with some trail cameras. Hopefully I'll catch something on video after all this time. Edit 3, update, just spoke to my old roommate that saw it up close. She said it was more eerie than downright scary. It looked at her like it was curious, tilting its head to the side like a dog when you're holding something it wants. My hunting buddies and I all saw it from 30 to 50 feet away but she ended up being closer than all of us. She confirmed no features other than eyes, but it had sunken in spaces on the face where there would be features. I understand her not taking a picture. I wouldn't take a picture of a bear if it was 10 feet from me, let alone this thing. I was around 9 years old or so and was at my mom's friend's house, because they were having a little get together. My mom's best friend, at the time, decided to go get something, which was at a house nearby, down a dirt road, in the woods. My mom's friend decided to take my friend and me with her. I wish I had never gone with her. 
We rode with her, over there and when she got out, my friend and I stayed in her car and waited for her to come back. After sitting in her car for 10 minutes, we decided to get out, to see what was taking her so long. When we did that, she told us to get back in the car, so we did. As it turned out, she was buying weed, so we weren't welcome in the house. So, my buddy and I got back in her car and waited for her to come out. They had a lot of bulldogs at that property. The dogs had all been barking, like crazy, and then just stopped, all at once and went into their dog houses. That's when my friend and I saw this thing that looked like some kind of werewolf, coming from behind the car. We froze and just stared at it, as it walked by. Wow! It looked so demonic. When we saw it, we ducked down and laid on the floorboards. We laid there for what seemed like forever, until we heard my mom's friend hitting on the driver's window, trying to get us to let her in. I guess it left when it heard her come out of the house or something. I'm a 32-year-old lady, from the very northern tip of West Virginia. Most of my life has been lived in Hancock County. When I was little, we camped in tents, walked everywhere, hiked at parks, all that outside goodness. In my teens, we started going to state parks, to ride horses. I've been to Tomlinson Run, Beaver Creek State Park, Salt Fork, Raccoon Creek, and Vista Park, I think that was the name. We had a friend who was constantly inviting us to ride on people's land she had received permission from. I'm well acquainted with the local wildlife. I've seen all the major players, including koi dogs, and bears, and can identify most sounds in the forest. I love watching nature documentaries. I was looking to become a vet, so I studied a lot, on animals. Drawing and painting them got me very acquainted with animal anatomy. Was I ever into cryptozoology? Yes. I was a Dino crazy, little girl. My one babysitter had Reader's Digest Mysteries of the Unexplained. The thought of a plesiosaur, in Scotland or an apatosaurus, in the Congo, was just mind-blowing. Later in life, I started looking at it like folklore. It was interesting to read the accounts and learn the theories behind what people were seeing but I believed in them as much as a folklorist believes in dragons and trolls. I didn't have any interest in Bigfoot and I'd never heard of dogmen. I never had interest in looking, nor did the thoughts ever cross my mind. It seems I didn't need to go looking, they found me. We moved to the farm when I was about 10. Mom's dream was to have horses and she was finally able to live it. The farmhouse was haunted, mainly by the former residents of the house. I never felt threatened by them though. It's a little unnerving to have two men talking and moving the couch you're sitting on. Or should I say, it sounded like it. No one was home, no media was on, and yet, I was hearing two men, talking about how they were going to move the couch, and where, and the sound of furniture being dragged, right from under me. The land, itself, had its share of strangeness. Most things were benign though. We just shrugged and carried on. I honestly hated our woods. Anywhere else, I'd freely hike, but even in the yard, sometimes I felt watched. Heck, sometimes I thought something was staring in our windows. Now that I think of it, we did have things slam into our trailer. I'd think it was a horse that had gotten loose, but when I'd go out, to investigate, I'd find nothing. I'd chalk it up to a deer. I used my horses' breeds for their names, rather than think up names for them. Anyone who knows me knew my horses' names. I was 18 to 19, in this encounter. By this time, we gave up on cows, I hate, hate, hate them, and just had the horses and chickens. Someone knocked on the door, at 2 a.m. I'd only been asleep two hours, but years of conditioning had my heart pumping and my mind clearing. Someone knocking that early meant trouble. It usually meant horses or livestock had gotten out. I wasn't disappointed. Our neighbor said the horses were in his yard. My mind wasn't totally awake, so I didn't think to ask which yard they were in. My stepfather came out, asked what was up, and told me they were my horses, so deal with it. Mom was working. 
That was nothing new. This lot of horses had three expert escape artists. I had the routine down. It was pretty dark out, but I did have some moonlight, to help. The security light only went so far. Then of course, it shut off, after so long. When it was cloudy, you literally had to watch that you didn't walk off, into the ravine, it was so pitch. I was naturally in a foul mood, cursing my horses, and wondering if some drunk had gone through the fence, again. It happened a lot. As I got closer to the brown barn, I realized a horse was flipping out. It was running back and forth, squealing, and carrying on. I went in and grabbed the halters and leads. I paused for a moment, to see if any other horse or horses had replied to the horse I heard squeal. That would give me an idea where the other horse or horses might be. There was no reply. That was odd. I was thinking, crap. They're on the other side of the hill. It was the only reason in my mind they wouldn't be replying. Let's just say, when they followed our cut trails, to the other side, it took us an hour to traverse through the woods and lead them back. And even with two guys, on a four-wheeler, and my mom, that was a freaky trek. I felt like I was being watched and followed. Maybe, it wasn't paranoia. So, the land is set up like this. The brown barn was connected to a small pasture, about half an acre long, which then connects to a seven-acre pasture. Pretty much in the center, on the outside edge of the large pasture, was an old, white barn, that we turned into a run-in. I decided to tackle the horse still in the fence, so I could bring her down to the small pasture, to keep her from escaping too. Maybe, the others would follow. I had to walk clear to the other side of the pasture, to get to the panicking horse. It was my mother's psycho Appaloosa mare. I tried to catch her and nearly got trampled, a few times trying. She was frothing at the mouth and her eye whites were really showing. Was I alarmed? No. As I said, psycho. I noticed my other six were across the road. They were standing in a tiny, little fenced-in area, under a spotlight. They were standing motionless and not touching a blade of grass. I was wondering how the neighbor managed to herd them into that tiny fenced-in area, with that tiny door. Three of those horses were over 16 hands tall. One was a draft horse cross. The doorway was actually small enough, he touched both sides, going through. My thoroughbred mare took me two hours to corral, the last time she got out, much to my frustration, she was an awesome jumper. So, a stranger rounding them up and putting them into a tiny yard was mind-blowing. I've had horses since I was nine. I'm 32 now. I've had ponies and horses. I've had Appaloosas, Arabians, draft horses, quarter horses, walking horses, saddlebreds, thoroughbreds, mustangs, foals, geldings, mares, and geldings that still thought they were stallions. I've had a lot of horses, from all walks of life. I will tell you, they consistently do not like to be crammed into tight spaces, especially, not in a group. I had two severely abused horses, I was rehabbing, a thoroughbred that actually had PTSD, and a racking horse, that actually took me three years to touch, without some sort of a bad reaction. They did not like being in stalls, and all but one were mares. Mares are extremely moody and two of mine were particularly vicious, to those they didn't like. My walker mare only liked three other horses. She should have been kicking the crap out of the others there. Mine also didn't like to be under lights, when they escaped. They avoided them like the plague. And not eating grass, that was over ankle deep? That was unheard of. They were silent and dead still. My neighbor came out and told me that they were like that when he found them. He asked me if I needed help, but I said, no. My thoroughbred and racking horse mares did not like men. I told him I'd take them out, one at a time. I took one halter and lead and threw the rest outside the gate. I put the halter on my gelding and opened the gate, to lead him out. They had other plans though. All six came out, as a freaking unit. They were literally chest to butt, crammed together. 
My gelding and my Welsh mare had their chest pushing against me as we walked back to the brown barn. Normally, they did not do this. I wouldn't usually allow such bad behavior. We were on the main road, which I did not like. The speed limit is only 35, but people go 60. So, I tried to lead them through the large pasture gate. They wouldn't even go on that side of the road though. I was a little unnerved, by their behavior. So I lead them down to the brown barn and they went in. They were skittish though, picking at the hay I threw out, walking around restlessly, sticking to the barn like glue, and eyeing the upper pasture. I rationalize it by thinking, it's the appy flipping out, that's unnerving them. And why hadn't she come down yet? She had to have seen us all walk down. I rushed to the gate, between the little and big pastures, out of habit. I didn't want the herd to go back out, into the big pasture. I didn't have to worry. They didn't follow me, like they usually did. The gate was wide open, but the appy was still running and squealing, back and forth, in the same area. I started to go get her. Now, the neighbor's security lights didn't really light up my pasture. The road was higher than my pasture, so it was cast, in a shadow. I could make out her shape and some detail though. She took off, at a panicked gallop, swerved sideways, and jumped the stream. When she landed, she nearly landed on her face. She caught herself though and took off, at a dead gallop, again. I ducked behind a stump. If she would have hit me, I would have been dead. I went back and chained the gate. I decided to forego looking her over, until I got the halters and leads. She was too hot at the moment. I decided to walk on the road, instead of through the pasture, again. The pasture was uneven, unlit, and full of springs. Sometime, during this, clouds had taken over the sky. So there was no moonlight, to see by. The spot, on the road, where I was at, was paved and pretty well lit though, my neighbor was paranoid as mentioned. I had almost gotten to the white barn, when I got this sudden urge, to stop and look at a very specific spot, in the pasture. I would like to say, it was instinct that told me to look, but usually, I'd scan the woods first, to see what was watching me. That's usually where the watchers are. Instead, I just flicked on my flashlight, right on a certain spot. It was extremely close to where the mare was flipping out. I saw red eye shine. My first thought was, why in the world would a deer be there, with all that chaos? I was feeling a sense of extreme dread and didn't know why. Besides, it being where my horse was going nuts, told me, something else just wasn't right. I then realized, where the eyes were, relative to the walnut trees and my racing barrels. See, the road is above the pasture and the walnut trees were right at the same elevation, as the road. The pasture itself is sloped, to deal with the runoff, from the road. The barrel, it was next to, was on the low end of the incline. The barrels were white, so I could see a dim lighting, from my flashlight, on the one it was next to. This thing was too freaking big to be a deer. I was frozen, standing there, watching it. I just had this feeling, it was evil and that I had to keep track of those eyes. It was watching me. It slowly blinked a few times. It also looked over, into the woods, above the pasture. I know you ask your guests if they ever feel there are other ones out there. Well, let me tell you, it crossed my mind. With a sinking stomach, I flashed my flashlight over the woods, to see if I would catch eye shine. I didn't see any though. So, I went right back to the eyes. They were still there. I flicked back and forth, making sure nothing was sneaking up on me. I don't know how long I stood there, watching, frozen. Someone could have come around the bend and hit me, with their car, I was so focused. Finally, it started to move off. It glanced at me, sideways, a few times, only one eye. I think it went into the copse of trees, around the creek. I heard nothing. That wasn't surprising though. The horses were still restless and making noises. I stood there, a long time after, looking for eye shine. I was wondering if it could have been a bear. 
I didn't think so though. The eyes were consistent, in height, until it disappeared. Bears are clumsy, on their back legs. On this uneven, inclined ground, I have no doubt a bear would have dropped to the ground, to go on all fours. Even the rear up and drop down behavior bears do, when they're trying to see something, wouldn't work. We had one cross our pasture before. He made a lot of noise, going through the woods. The horses settled down quicker with the bear. I was almost to my neighbors, at this point. I considered leaving the couple, hundred dollars of tack, at his house, halters and leads aren't cheap. I had no doubt, if I left them there, they'd be gone in the morning. My mother would be pissed. So, I darted over, grabbed them, and ran like a bat out of hell. I know, I know. I should have left the tack. I also know, you're not supposed to run, but I couldn't even conceive what I had just seen. I got into the barn, threw the tack down, and hung with the horses. I wasn't going to go back up that pitch black driveway on foot. I figured, with the horses, I'd have a warning, and the barn had plenty of sharp things. I didn't go back up, until dawn. I was frozen stiff by that time. I've had years to think this over. It unnerves the crap out of me. How long was that thing there? Was that what was keeping the appy mare from coming down? Was it right there, in the shadows, while I was trying to catch her or was it in the unlit barn? I walked through, to get to the road? Was it the reason the appy swerved and nearly fell? How did my horses get out? I never did find how they got out. Did they panic and jump the fence? I did check the fence line, away from the woods. I did look for tracks, around the barrel. Sadly, the ground was hard, from frost that morning. But, I will say, the appy mare was running for a good while. The ground was severely torn up and turned into a muddy, mess, it was high noon when I went down there, to check, and the ground had melted. I'll bet it was her, that woke the neighbor up. It took them about a week, to fully settle. I don't know if whatever it was was still in the area or if they were that traumatized. It wasn't too long after that, my mother filed for divorce. My, ex-stepfather got the farm and I moved in with her, in the city. Even with all of the weird crap going on there, there were non-bipedal things going on too, I miss it terribly. Maybe it's more accurate to say, I miss the farm life rather than the actual place. I'd love to get back onto a farm again, but I'd probably hesitate to move back there. I never told anyone about the I shine event. I didn't see the actual creature and really, how do you convey that unnatural or horror-inducing feeling? You saw I shine, whoop dee doo My mother would have given me the benefit of the doubt, but my mother often told family members things. They made my life enough of a living hell. I didn't want to give them more ammo. Hello, this is the story of how I quit my job. This isn't a liberating story of breaking the shackles and going to my dream job. This is a story of leaving a demonic place. I am a park ranger, it all goes back to one week ago. I was in my truck taking the usual route around the park until I saw a white van, it wasn't even on the trail. It was just sitting there in the middle of the forest. I called in a 10 to 92, illegally parked vehicle. Until my radio went off 10 to 4, permission to investigate. I exited my truck and walked toward the van. The environment was completely silent, except for my engine still running, and my footsteps which seemed ever so loud. I walked around the van, nothing seemed odd till I got to the other side of the van. I saw a black pentagram spray painted on the van. I started to notice that there were scuff marks and little blemishes here and there. I was walking back to my vehicle to call in tow when I heard a roar, it didn't sound like a bear. It sounded like something more demonic. I walked toward the source of the sound. I walked past the van and walked, flashlight in hand. I heard its violent cries again. I pulled my gun out and stood frozen, I heard footsteps zoom behind me. I turned around to see nothing. I blew a sigh of relief. Knowing it was all probably in my head. I walked back to my car and called in a tow truck. 
I looked out into the forest, I noticed two red eyes staring back at me. I blinked and they were gone. I thought it had to be in my head, it had too. There's no such thing as monsters repeating in my brain like a broken record. Eventually the tow truck pulled up. The man got out and I got out of my car too. You look worse for wear, the tow man said. Lack of sleep I said, that was somewhat true, I was too embarrassed to say I was terrified. Eventually we hooked up the van and that was that. I got in my truck and drove off. That was the end of it, or that's what I thought. After getting a few complaints and other issues I started to relax again, the only thing that bothered me was I felt like I was being watched. Eventually I came up to a down tree blocking the path. I checked my GPS and called in we have a 10 to 53 at J, 28 southeast. Then I heard 10 to 12, we are sending assistance. As I got out of my car I walked towards the fallen tree. I tried to push it to see if I could make some progress, while I waited for backup. It was useless. I kicked it in frustration. Then I heard it. Not again I thought. My heart was racing. Snap. I twig snapped and I instantly turned around. It was tall and muscular. I raised my flashlight and saw its face. Oh God. The face. It had long goat horns and the face of a goat, with dark red eyes. Those eyes. It had been following me. I was face to face with the goat man. I dropped my flashlight and ran with a gun in hand. I ran, but I could hear this thing getting closer. I knew it would catch me, so I turned around and fired off a few shots. That seemed to scare it. I looked and managed to get a headshot, yet I still stood. It looked at me and fled into the distance, I ignored the 10 to 53 and got into my car and drove off. I went to one of the ranger centers and reported it in, apparently there's been multiple reports. There have been multiple reports and they did nothing. I turned in my badge at that moment. I'm haunted by that thing, its eyes still appear in my nightmares. After six dead acted years of working there I quit. I regret it a bit, but I hope I never see the goat man again. I was a marine on military installation. I don't know why, but me and two of my friends decided to stay there overnight as we were shuttled from the barracks. I do remember it was late, maybe after 1.32 am. One of my buddies, who had been out drinking but not excessively, we had been told not to go outside, so we had to just walk around the inside but had no contact with any of the other marines. It was dark inside, so we were using our flashlights. I went to the bathroom, which was directly across from my room. When I came out and my buddies were not there, I began looking for them but they seemed gone. I knew it would be bad if they drank more and became belligerent. Suddenly, I saw a shadow move at the end of one hallway. Turning my light, I saw one of them hunkered down beside a trash can. He said he needed to go outside, he ate some food that didn't agree with him. He took off his pants and wiped himself with some paper towels. He was brains out. He cleaned himself up and walked toward me. Suddenly, he realized he had no clothes on. This happened at the trash can where I saw the shadow move about 40 feet away from me. Without saying anything to my friends who were caught with their pants down, I took off running toward the exit. As I got closer, I felt like somebody or something was following me. Fast footsteps behind me that sounded like they were wearing combat boots. How could anybody be walking around in boots that late at night? It made no sense. These heavy footfalls were definitely chasing after me now. I began screaming bloody murder as I ran around the corner and around another one. Triggering my friends who, triggering their flashlights, saw me running like a maniac through the hallways. I thought I was gonna die from fear. Well maybe from fear and also from exhaustion. My two friends caught up with me when I finally stopped running. By this time, we had gotten separated from each other by about 100 or so yards. We didn't know where anything was, so we went back into our rooms and fell asleep. The next day, we were told that nobody else had gotten any sleep because of us making too much noise. Apparently, 
They heard us screaming but couldn't find us because it got real dark outside and due to lights being out ordered earlier that evening. We didn't tell anybody what had happened. It would have just gotten us into worse trouble. I think my friends said something to some of the other marines after we got back, but nobody else saw or heard anything. This is one of many terrifying experiences that I had during my time in the Marine Corps. I don't know if this is a ghost, demon, a bad dream, or what, but I do know what I saw and heard wasn't normal, and it definitely did not feel like an ordinary night. I'm sorry if this story is butchered, I'm a terrible writer, but I felt it important to get this story off my chest. Hopefully, you could wade through my bad storytelling. I crouched in the shadow of a decaying building, clutching my rifle as tightly as my trembling hands would allow. The air was thick with tension, and the taste of fear lingered on my tongue. It was the heart of the Bosnian War, and Sarajevo was a ghost town haunted by death and uncertainty. My perch offered a clear view of the desolation that stretched out before me, a fractured cityscape, ruined by the ravages of war. My Navy SEAL unit and I had become guardians of this battered city, the last remnants of a once proud army now reduced to a desperate few. We were snipers, tasked with watching over our besieged homeland, picking off any Serbian threats that dared to venture too close to our lines. The nights were the worst, dark, silent, and fraught with the unseen. It was on one of these long, chilling nights that I first glimpsed the creature that would haunt my dreams for years to come. I was stationed on night watch duty, my scope trained on the eerie woods that bordered the city. The trees, stripped bare by winter's icy grip, appeared spectral in the moonlight. Then, I saw it, a shape that defied all logic and reason. Emerging from the shadows of the woods, the creature moved with a strange grace, both mesmerizing and terrifying. It was a quadruped, roughly the size of a horse, yet its appearance defied categorization. It resembled a grotesque fusion of bear, hyena, wolf, and panther, all melded together into a nightmarish form. Its snout was long, resembling that of a wolf or a pig, lined with teeth that gleamed in the faint moonlight. Its ears were small and rounded, lying close to its head, and its neck was a sinewy, powerful column. But what truly set it apart was its tail, a thick, muscular appendage resembling that of a panther, capable of knocking down men and animals with brutal force. My heart pounded in my chest as I watched the beast through my sniper scope. I could scarcely believe my eyes. Each of its feet confounded description. Some claimed it had cloven hooves, while others insisted that each digit was tipped with a hoof. Its claws, heavy and formidable, resembled hooves as well, and they glistened ominously in the moonlight. As I observed the creature with a mixture of terror and fascination, it suddenly let out a screech that chilled my bones. The sound was otherworldly, a haunting wail that seemed to echo with centuries of malevolence. Without warning, it bolted back into the woods, vanishing as quickly as it had appeared. I hesitated, torn between the urge to pursue this enigmatic beast and the knowledge that a Serbian sniper lurked nearby. The risk was too great, and I knew that duty demanded my attention be focused on our human adversaries. Reluctantly, I decided to remain hidden and vigilant. The remainder of that night dragged on, my mind consumed by the image of the creature. My comrades dismissed my account as the product of a fatigued imagination, but I knew what I had seen was real. That night marked the beginning of an obsession, a relentless pursuit to uncover the truth about the creature that had stalked the shadows of Sarajevo. In the years that followed, I returned to those woods, searching for any trace of the beast. I interviewed survivors and gathered accounts from those who claimed to have encountered it. Some believed it was a supernatural entity, a harbinger of death in a city already teetering on the brink of annihilation. But no matter how hard I searched, the creature remained elusive, a phantom of the night that defied explanation. It left me with haunting questions, a mystery that would forever remain unsolved. The Bosnian War eventually ended, and the scars of that brutal conflict began to heal. But for me, 
the memory of that night, and the enigma of the creature, lingered on, a testament to the horrors of war and the unexplained mysteries that sometimes emerge from its depths. I was just a young teenager living in Alabama in the year 2008 or 2009 when this peculiar and unsettling incident occurred. At the time, I resided with my grandmother and grandfather. I won't delve into the reasons why I lived with them, but it was during a period when we were preparing to move. Our attention was focused on sprucing up the yard, laying down new grass around the house. We had enlisted a few helpers, including my grandparents, to assist in this endeavor. Meanwhile, my younger brother and I took advantage of the situation to play in the street and explore our modest home. Our house, while not particularly large, had a cozy deck at the back, overlooking a small patch of woods. As the landscaping work continued, my brother and I frolicked in the street, reveling in the simplicity of our childhood. However, an inexplicable feeling began to gnaw at me, like something was amiss in the woods behind our house. It was as if an unseen presence lurked there, keeping a watchful eye on us, observing our every move. My senses sharpened, and I became increasingly aware of subtle cues from the woods, rustling leaves, swaying branches. Was it just the wind, or was there something more to it? Approximately 40 or 50 minutes passed in this disconcerting atmosphere. Eventually, hunger and thirst pulled us back indoors, where we had a meal and enjoyed some much-needed respite. When we returned to play, the eerie feeling seemed to have subsided, and the sounds that had stirred my unease had fallen silent. The sensation was fleeting, and I brushed it aside, attributing it to childish paranoia. For the next 10 minutes, my brother and I resumed our play. Then, out of the blue, my intuition once again went on high alert. This time, I stopped in my tracks and cast my gaze toward the woods. I sensed that something wasn't right, and curiosity, mixed with a tinge of fear, propelled me closer to the forest's edge. Standing there, on the verge of the woods, I strained my senses, but all was quiet. The rustling leaves and swaying branches had ceased. Whatever had stirred my anxiety seemed to have retreated, leaving me with an eerie stillness. Uncertain and hesitant, I couldn't bring myself to venture deeper into the woods. I simply turned away, deciding it was best to steer clear of the area. The unsettling episode had concluded, for the time being. The following day, we found ourselves nearing the completion of our yard work. The setting sun cast long shadows as it dipped below the horizon. My family was immersed in the final stages of our preparations, and I had momentarily forgotten about my disquieting experience near the woods. As my brother and I resumed our play, I strolled behind the house, oblivious to the sense of foreboding that had gripped me before. Then, it happened, a chilling encounter that would forever haunt my memories. As I stood behind the house, an overwhelming sense of being watched washed over me. I slowly turned to my right and was met with a sight that defied logic and sent shivers down my spine. There, lying on the ground, was a massive, grotesque creature, resembling a werewolf or an upright, canine-like being. Its eyes, yellow and piercing, bore into me with an intensity that sent fear coursing through my veins. I remained rooted to the spot, paralyzed by terror, as I locked eyes with this nightmarish entity. Several seconds passed in eerie silence, during which time felt both elongated and compressed. My heart raced, and my mind reeled, struggling to comprehend the impossible sight before me. Then, with the swiftness of a nightmare, I turned and bolted from the scene, sprinting toward the front of the house. Gasping for breath, I stumbled into the presence of my grandparents, breathless and terror-stricken. Frantically, I tried to convey what I had just witnessed, a monstrous creature with yellow eyes lurking behind our home. My voice trembled with fear as I recounted the nightmarish encounter, but to my dismay, neither of my grandparents believed my story. They dismissed my account as a product of an overactive imagination or, perhaps, a harmless illusion. Their indifference left me feeling vulnerable and alone, haunted by the vivid image of that grotesque figure. 
As they encouraged me to return to my play, I couldn't help but wonder if my experience was real or merely a trick of my young mind. Days turned into weeks, and the memory of that nightmarish encounter remained etched in my psyche. The enigmatic presence in those woods continued to perplex me, leaving me with lingering doubts and a deep-seated unease. To this day, I still grapple with unanswered questions, what was that creature? Was it real, or had my youthful imagination played a cruel trick on me? Before we moved away from that place, I couldn't shake the feeling that those woods held secrets far beyond our comprehension. Even after we departed, I often found myself reminiscing about the distant sounds and fleeting glimpses I had encountered there. The woods concealed their mysteries well, leaving me with a sense of unease and an enduring fascination with the unexplained. Back in the summer of 2020, I was traveling with my partner to Boise, Idaho from Colorado to visit his family and stay for a camping trip. This trek is nearly 15 hours long and while you can do it in a day, it's better if you stop to rest. Having lived in Utah at one point in time, I was very eager to show him the natural hot springs in Spanish Fork. They are located deep in Diamond Fork Canyon and require a 45-minute hike from the parking lot. Still, we were both excited to get out and moving after seven hours in the car. When we arrived at the first parking lot however, the gate was shut and locked tight. A sign taped to the metal reed closed. Absolutely no access to hot springs. Fines $2,000 max or something to that nature. We were bummed. COVID had shut down many things and we figured that this was outside so there's no way it was going to be closed. After some research on the government website, we discovered that a body had possibly been found in the springs and was likely the cause for the locked gate. Sad and tired of sitting in the car, we drove back down the canyon road to find a spot to camp for the night. Most of the more established campsites were closed due to COVID or were already taken for the night. This was fine since we prefer more dispersed camping anyway. So we picked a random road to turn on as we drove closer to exiting the canyon. Road 338. Most of the road was a well-kept dirt road. We passed some promising spots near a creek and maybe two or three other people already set up for the night. We wanted to go a little further to see if there was anything with that wow factor. Sounds funny but some sites give off that this is the one. Feeling. Finally we came to a dead end in the main road with a fire mitigation road to the right. At this very spot there was a strange boulder with some type of inscription on it, partially surrounded by a wooden fence. I had to investigate. The inscription read Diamond Battle June 20th 1866. No way. A memorial for a battle that happened right here. A feeling of uneasiness and oddly, respect, washed over me. After traveling up the fire road and not finding what we were hoping for in a campsite, we decided to pick a spot by the small creek we passed on the way in. It was getting dark quickly but we set up our tent in no time at all and got a fire going. The creek was loud but peaceful. Though, ever since I read that inscription, I couldn't shake this strange feeling. I'm not a paranoid person but I kept feeling on the edge of my seat. Like something was watching us from the woods just across the water. As the night grew darker, this feeling grew stronger. I decided I didn't want to be in the open anymore and retreated to the tent to get some rest while my partner stayed up to enjoy the fire. I snuggled into our sleeping bag and exhaled comfortably, listening to the creek that was now much quieter and was a bit further from the tent. I started to drift off when I heard it. Soft chanting. Rhythmic drums. My eyes shot open. Was I really hearing that? I strained my ears to listen over the running water. I couldn't quite get a clear sound but it was definitely there. This is when I noticed the ground was also rumbling. As if horses were stampeding down the road, 100 feet from our sight. I didn't know if I should get out to tell my partner but I had the strange feeling that if I said it out loud it would make it more true and that an army of spirits would spring from the trees and into our campsite. Before I could make the decision I was dead asleep. This was somehow the most peaceful slumber I have ever had. The next morning, 
We packed up our tent and left no trace that we had ever spent the night by Little Diamond Creek. When I finally entered cell service, I did a Google search of that memorial in Diamond Fork, Utah. It turns out there was a battle there between the Utes and the Mormon militia and lives were lost on that mountainside. After reading this, I decided to tell my partner what I heard last night before falling asleep. I told him about the chanting and the drumming and even the stomping of horses. He looked at me in disbelief and said he heard the exact same thing. I guess I was only in the tent 10 minutes before he got spooked standing alone by the fire, hearing this distant chanting and drums. He came into the tent and experienced that same peaceful sleep I had. I feel as though we were being watched over by those Native Americans that lost their lives there. A strong but calm and protective presence. If you're ever on Diamond Fork Road, I hope you visit and pay respects to the memorial of the diamond battle and maybe the spirits of the land will watch over you too. I've been thinking about this for years and I am still baffled. When I was a child, maybe 11, I lived near the river in Pukeski County on very private land. One road, no walkthroughs, fenced off. Behind our property was river and we could walk to it but anyone trying to access the property would have to boat or swim in, stumble through the woods, stumble through a large garden we had and a larger yard with huge floodlights that were motion sensing. In front of the house was more dense woods and our private road, one way in, one out, more porch lights and at the end of that road was a steel gate. So I was maybe 9 or 10 and I wanted to catch fireflies. My mom said okay, gave me a mason jar and I went to leave and told my mom I was turning off the front porch light to see them better. She said it was okay, but not to go to the tree line. So I was out there for six or seven fireflies worth when I started to see something odd. There was a strange light hanging in between some trees. Did not move, did not turn, shake, rotate. Nothing. I stared at it for a while fascinated and scared but trying to puzzle out what it was. It appeared to be a ball and not a beam, and was definitely well defined. I was starting to get past my fascination and I was getting scared. Then another appeared further in the trees maybe 5 feet further back. They were literally just hanging there in the air. Single balls of light, clearly defined. I decided enough was enough and ran to the house. My parents said I was hysterical enough to warrant a rifle search of the property and my mom called the police who came out. No one found anything. No evidence of a fire, lanterns hung in trees as a joke. Nothing. I already knew it was neither but I hoped someone would figure it out. I was in deep shit with my dad who told me I was making up nonsense and I got the belt and was put on a diet of stacking wood for the winter my dad was splitting, housework, etc. Anyone have an idea what this might have been? The other night my sister and I were riding to our friends in our golf cart. She was driving, I was on the passenger seat. As we neared a stretch of woods I looked over to the woods, in my mind I assumed it was a deer within 0.1 seconds, yet this was no deer. I literally screamed, out of fear without realizing as something on all fours, that looked like a human on all fours, but wasn't, ran into the woods. This thing was white, and looked like a human running on all fours, but much faster and not human, if that makes sense. Later that night we were parked by our friends and I believe something was watching us, as we kept hearing sticks snapping and cracking from the woods, and I felt weirded out. Well once again that's not the end, Today in my car I drove by the woods and right in the exact spot where this creature began to run or crawl into the woods, there was a balloon floating there. WTF I don't know if that can be a coincidence. I'm not entirely sure what the creature was, I've read people suggesting anywhere from a skinwalker to a crawler. As a child or young teen, I lived a very strange situation in the woods. I am not sure if this encounter may have been some kind of entity, or perhaps something different. I hope someone can give me more information about what happened to me and my friend. I, female, 
was around 12 years old at the time and one of my best friends, let's call him Alex, must have been 10. Alex's father had purchased a large amount of forested land around 100 km away from the city we lived in, Montreal, Canada. It was all forest when Alex's family acquired it. They cleared a little patch to build a house, and the rest was pure, unadulterated forest. Their land was cut in two by a dirt road that, if you followed it for several kilometers, led to a few houses and their land was very different depending on which side of the dirt road you looked. On the right side, where their house was, the forest was light and luminous, or at least it felt that way. It was not too dense, with little rolling hills. A lovely place to play. On the left side of the road, though it was another story. First, there was a deep ditch, perhaps two meters deep, which then became a quite high and steep hill. Weirdly enough, all along the long road, the ditch was full of car parts. A set of car wheels here, a door there, a steering wheel way over there, all old and overgrown with moss. And over the steep hill, the forest gave off a really bad vibe. It had lots of very tall, dark coniferous trees, with almost black trunks, and the place seemed somehow devoid of light or life. Climbing the hill, which we seldom were willing to do because of the creeps it gave us, there was some sort of swamp there. When we were there, there was this strange pressure, we sensed a kind of animal instinct that told us to leave this place. The strange atmosphere was spontaneously obvious to both me and Alex, and we playfully called that side of the road Demon's Forest. One weekend day, probably in 2001 or 2002, my family and I came to visit Alex's family. Bored by the adults, my friend and I decided to go and play in the forest. Alex's father told us to watch out, there was an animal that had been rummaging in their trash bin and causing other nuisances. He said it was a dog that looked somewhat like a Rottweiler that surely belonged to someone living up the dirt road. He warned us that we shouldn't interact with the dog if we saw it, as it didn't look healthy, as far as he could tell, or something was weird about it. He said it somehow looked diseased or contagious, or had patches of fur missing, can't remember exactly. And so we set out on our walk. It was autumn and the leaves were pretty and golden, many having already fallen to the ground, it was a calm, slightly overcast windless day. The air was very still and calm. Alex and I decided to walk along the dirt road, with the pleasant section of the forest to our right, and Demon's Forest to our left. We chatted while following the road as it was rising up a slope. As usual, we were slightly creeped out going up the road because of the weird vibes of the forest to the left side, but we were challenging ourselves to be brave and trying to not really think about how unsettling it felt. A good distance away from their home, when it was already well out of sight, I noticed the first strange thing of the day. Out of the steep hill on left side of the road, there was a very large and dark pine tree hanging over the road. Somebody had attached a pink ribbon to one of the branches, which was already strange, since this was the territory of Alex's family, and they had no daughters, or other little girls likely to hang around, or other people who may be owners of pink ribbons who were likely to hang out on this deserted road. The strange thing was, the ribbon was flailing strongly in the wind, its loose ends were flapping almost horizontally. The thing is, it was a completely windless day. There was no wind to speak of. The ribbon was within my reach, so I even touched it as it was flailing. I even licked my finger and held it in the air to check if I could feel any wind or air current at all, as my dad had taught me. The air was perfectly still. Yet the ribbon failed. I mentioned it to my friend. He seemed distracted and was younger than me and sometimes didn't catch on to what I said so I didn't press the matter. We continued our climb. We reached a place where the hill on the left side of the road had a gentler slope and began further away from the road. In fact, it looked as if the hill was kind of carved out in a way that would have made it easy for us to climb to get into Demon's Forest. It almost seemed as if the hill was carved in a sloping half circle, like in a theater, and the road we stood on would have been the stage. It gave us a very clear, treeless view of the hillside, full of golden and red fallen leaves. The trees began at the top of the hill, 
maybe nine meters higher. We stopped to admire the view, Canadian autumns are a sight to behold. Alex suddenly got really excited. He thought he heard something in the demon woods up the hill and he really wanted me to pay attention. He explained that there are wild cats in that forest, they had spotted them with his dad. One of them had reportedly had kittens, kittens being one of the most exciting things in the world for kids our age, getting us all riled up. But somehow, my hackles were up and I could really relax, even thinking about adorable wild kittens. He actually thought he had heard the cat meow in the forest, up the hill, close by. I heard nothing of the sort and thought he was inventing it, he vehemently suggested that we try meowing at it to see if it would respond. Maybe it would even bring its kittens along and we could see them and play with them, he said. I hadn't heard any sounds at all and didn't really like his idea of screaming meows into the creepy forest. What kind of wild cat would respond to human children, anyway? Wouldn't it be obvious that we are not cats by the sound of us? That seemed like a dumb idea to me. Before I could try to talk him out of it, he loudly meowed into the forest. To my utter shock, the forest meowed back. Alex was delighted. He meowed again. Something in the forest answered again. I was actually shocked, this didn't make sense to me. And it creeped me out. But I suspended my disbelief to see what would happen. He kept doing meowing over and over, for every one of his meows, there was one coming back in response from the woods. Something felt off to me. Feral or wild animals didn't behave that way, even at 12 years old I realized that. And it wasn't an echo, the cat did not bounce back any sound that we threw at it except meows, which it reciprocated immediately, and anyway, there were no hard rocky surfaces around off of which sound could bounce off, everything was covered in a soft layer of sound dulling leaves. Alex got even more excited, listen. The cat is coming towards us, she's coming to see us with her kittens. To my surprise, he was right. There was a rustle of dead leaves coming from above us, from above the slope in the creepy forest. It seemed like the rustling was getting closer to us. But it was way off. Because cats are small and light, and careful with their steps. They don't make a ruckus when they walk through the woods. But here, the rustling leaves sound was extremely obvious, along with the meowing. And in fact, it sounded more like steps. Like someone with two legs walking in the leaves. And it was getting closer to us. My alarm signals were starting to go off with the wrongness of it all, while my younger friend was oblivious. He was calling it more vehemently, noticing that it was coming towards us. Then I realized what seemed so wrong, the sound was coming towards us. But there was nothing to be seen. Right in front of us we had the gently sloping hill, treeless and clearly visible, anything coming from the forest should have been plainly exposed to view. There was nothing. No source for the rustling sound, nothing moving. Oh her kittens are joining her. Listen, there are more sounds. They're coming to play with us. He was right. The walking sound seemed to have multiplied and now came from various directions at once. Ever getting closer, with nothing being visible. Something was way off, I wanted to leave. But Alex was getting mad at me, the kittens were almost here and he wanted to see them, he insisted. At this point as was extremely tense and fight or flight was activating from the wrongness of it all. We were alone and quite exposed on this theater stage too. Whatever was getting closer to us, which was, more and more obviously with every moment, decidedly not kittens. I was on the verge to force him go run home. And then, suddenly, I heard a very loud panting sound. Right at my feet. During the first millisecond, I got only mildly surprised, we had a huge husky at home. I was used to it panting next to my feet. But then, a sense of profound dread downed on me as I realized that, obviously, my dog was not here. And it must be another dog, a very big one by the sound of it right at my feet. I panickingly looked down, ready to jump away from the dog that somehow got extremely close to me, almost on me, without my noticing. Only there is absolutely nothing at my feet. But I still hear the loud, 
breathy panting sound coming from there. I whirl around, all 360 degrees, screaming. Where is it coming from? There is nothing at my feet, or anywhere around me. There is nothing there. Yet the sound is clearly there. As I whirl about in a frenzy, I look up the dirt road we are following. Around 100 meters away, of the top of the slope, I see a lone dog standing. It looks somewhat similar to a Rottweiler, but in very, very bad shape. Extremely unkempt, with patches of fur missing, shaggy and dirty as heck, with some skin exposed where the fur is missing. It looks down at us, too. Obviously, there is no way that I could hear it panting at that distance, and the source of the sound is at my feet. At that point, the flight instinct wins in Simi me. I have never run as desperately and as fast in my whole life, thank goodness it was all downhill. Alex kept pace right beside me, terrified. We made it home in one piece. We didn't walk in these woods anymore. I came back to Alex's place several times in my life. I never wanted to walk in the woods again. We had amazing parties at his house as teens. I was often there rather drunk and having a great time but I always had this very stressful sensation when I went out of his house, especially at night. When I slept over there, I had these extremely strange experiences where, when I woke up, I sensed as if something was there and was observing me. In my mid-awake state, I even saw something, floating near the ceiling. It had the sensation tie it was not an immediate threat, though, it was. Observing. I am not sure Ty whatever this is was related to what happened on the dirt road. We never discussed what happened that day. As I researched it now, I see that this land is historically Algonquin land. Though one source seemed to say Mohawk, if anybody can help clarify what happened, I would be thankful. The year was 2010 when the inexplicable events began to unfold setting the stage for a series of bizarre occurrences that would forever change my perspective on the world around me. It all revolved around my best friend, who lived on the outskirts of a quaint, small community, nestled amidst dense woods and brush. His home was a sanctuary of seclusion, surrounded by private property, with the nearest neighbors located a quarter of a mile away in both directions. It was an idyllic place, offering the solitude and serenity that most people only dream of. Little did we know, the tranquility of those woods concealed secrets that defied explanation. It was a crisp autumn evening when the first hint of strangeness manifested itself. My best friend and his girlfriend had decided to have a picnic in his front yard, savoring the cool evening air and each other's company. As they enjoyed their meal, he took a bite of an apple, only to find it far too sour for his taste. Nonchalantly, he tossed the partially eaten apple into his front yard, assuming that some hungry critter would eventually find it and make a meal of it. In the grand scheme of things, it was just one apple, a small, inconsequential act. The next morning, he ventured into his yard to retrieve the forgotten apple. To his surprise, it was nowhere to be found. At the time, he attributed its disappearance to some ravenous woodland creature, nothing more. After all, he often left food out for deer and other wildlife to enjoy, and the idea that an apple had gone missing seemed inconsequential in the grand scheme of things. About a week passed, and life carried on as usual. My friend came home from work one evening, expecting nothing out of the ordinary. But as he approached his porch, he was met with a sight that would send shivers down his spine. A dead fox lay lifeless on his doorstep, its eyes grotesquely bulging from their sockets. It was a horrifying sight, the animal appeared to have been strangled to death. Panic and confusion overwhelmed him as he struggled to comprehend the grisly tableau that lay before him. He couldn't help but wonder if someone was playing a macabre prank, toying with his sanity. And then, to his astonishment and dread, he spotted the familiar apple, the very one he had thrown into the yard, with one bite taken out of it. It was a grotesque and unsettling tableau. Fear and paranoia gripped him, but he couldn't bring himself to report the incident to the authorities. Instead, he chose to wait, 
believing that if this was the work of a prankster, they would eventually grow bored and move on. As weeks turned into months, he found some semblance of normalcy, and the bizarre incident faded into the recesses of his memory. The onset of spring brought a renewal of hope and the promise of warmer days. My best friend and his girlfriend decided to enjoy a pleasant evening indoors, sharing a meal within the comforts of his home. Little did they know that this tranquil evening would soon descend into a nightmarish encounter that defied all reason. It was his girlfriend who first spotted it, a colossal, dark figure standing in the front yard, roughly 50 feet away. Her piercing scream shattered the evening's tranquility, sending him rushing to the door in a frenzied panic. Swinging the door open, he was met with a sight that would haunt his dreams for years to come. Before him stood an enormous, enigmatic creature, a black mass, towering at a height of about five to six feet. The fading twilight obscured the creature's features, leaving it shrouded in shadow. But what seized his attention was the object in its hand, a lifeless raccoon, its size and grotesque appearance sending chills down his spine. In that moment, his gaze locked onto the creature's eyes, or at least, where its eyes should have been. He couldn't make out any definitive features or distinct facial characteristics, but the sensation that it was staring directly at him was undeniable. Panic coursed through his veins as he felt the creature's gaze bore into his very soul. Suddenly, as if aware of his presence, the creature darted behind a nearby tree, disappearing from view. My best friend was left standing there, trembling and bewildered, struggling to process the unfathomable encounter that had just unfolded before him. His gut told him what he had seen, what had appeared in his front yard, was none other than a Sasquatch, a creature of legend and myth. Over the next couple of days, he mulled over the experience, convinced that this elusive creature was the same entity responsible for the fox's gruesome demise and the peculiar apple incidents from the previous autumn. Strangely, the mysterious visitor had not reappeared or engaged in any further activity around his home, leaving him in a state of perpetual uncertainty. The years have since passed, but the memory of that chilling encounter continues to linger, an enigma forever etched into the annals of our shared history. Though time has provided some distance from that harrowing night, the unanswered questions persist, haunting my friend and serving as a constant reminder of the inexplicable and the unknown that lurk just beyond the threshold of our comprehension. I don't know if this is the right place to put this so please guide me if I'm wrong. My brother had a paranormal experience he doesn't even remember. A few years ago, my younger brother, 16 at the time, had come complaining of feeling very ill. He was a grayish color, sweating and complaining of pains in his stomach. My mum put him to bed. The next day he was worse. She called the doctor who told her to put him on an antibiotic and he would be fine, if it persisted, the doctor said not to bring him until the following day. My mum was told not to bring him to the hospital. However, after two hours, when he wasn't perking up she went against those suggestions and took him to our local hospital. Upon his arrival there, they quickly linked him up with morphine and rushed him to the city hospital, bigger, quicker etc. They were told his appendix had burst and if my parents had waited a few hours more, he would have died in his sleep. My brother was quickly rushed into an emergency surgery which lasted around 4 to 5 hours. Now to the paranormal part. My mother is convinced my brother had died during this operation. For what duration she's unsure, but to this day she is convinced. When he had woken up, he was obviously very high on morphine. And what he had said chilled my parents to the bone. He had told them he had talked to my grandparents. Both of which sat in a white room on chairs, with an empty one next to them. He had went to sit but Granda told me that I wasn't allowed to sit there yet. My brother and I had never met my grandfather, he had died some six years before I had been born and all we had of him was a single picture that hung above our parents' fireplace. Needless to say, my mum had fallen to her knees in hysterics. To this day, he doesn't remember this happening. He doesn't even believe in ghosts. But that day, he was able to speak of it so easily, 
So naturally, my grandparents were with him on that table, and they made sure he came back to us. Last night, I was making myself something to eat, and when the oven timer went off, I went into the kitchen to take the cinnamon rolls out of the oven. As I was about to set them down on the counter, I heard my cat come up behind me, making her unique I want some, to noise. She never made the meow sound that most cats make, she had her own language, and this was a distinct sound she used when she wanted me to give her food. Every time I went into the kitchen to grab something to eat or had something delivered, she could always tell and would make sure to let me know she was interested. I always shared whatever I had, so it reinforced the behavior. No big deal. So when she approached me last night and indicated that she wanted some, saying it twice, I turned around to say, hang on a second. I live alone, and talking to the cat is one of the least weird things about me, as I turned around, I knew there was no way I was going to see her behind me, and, of course, she wasn't there. The thing is, I had to put her to sleep exactly one month and one day ago. She was about 20 years old and had suddenly gotten very sick, signaling it was her time to go. I was pretty sure I had seen her dart around a corner or something. She was all black, kind of on the smaller side, and had shorter legs. So, I just assumed my mind was playing tricks on me and ignored it. Last night, I know what I heard, and I heard it twice. There was no mistaking it, and I don't doubt it was some kind of something, even if just residual energy. My other cat, who passed away about three years ago, also seemed to visit me on occasion. I could feel her sitting at my feet or behind my back, her favorite places to be. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.